Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 11th meeting of the Local Government Communities Committee. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones and as the meeting papers are provided in digital format tablets? It may be used by members during the meeting, so if you see them on laptops, honestly, we're not doing other things. We're looking at our committee papers to better inform the questions that we have this morning. Uh, we have a full house. No apologies have been received from... Uh, MSPs this morning, I'm happy to see. And we move to agenda item one, supporting legislation parts two, three and five of the Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2015. Uh, so, as said, the committee will take evidence from a number of witnesses on parts 2, 3 and 5 of the Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2015, uh, nine Scottish statute instruments SSIs relating to part 2 community planning and part 5 asset transfer requests were laid before the Parliament on 10 November 2016. Further SSIs relating to Part 3 participation requests are expected to be laid later in the year, and therefore evidence relating to this section will refer to regulations which are currently in draft form and will feed into its formal security of the uh, scrutiny rather, of the, the final instruments. So, uh, with that said, can I now welcome Ian Cook, Director of Development Trust Association Scotland, Mary Wiley, Chief <coughs> Officer Highland Third Sector Interface, Rakir Shah, Policy Manager, Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations, and uh, a well-kept face around here. I'm pleased to see John Wilson, Chairperson, Glen Boyd Neighbourhood House and GNH. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for attending this morning. Uh, it's been indicated that there's no opening statements at this stage, so we'll go straight to questions with uh, uh, if witnesses are OK with that. And Andy Whiteman has indicated he would like to ask the first question. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Convener. Um, the, the statutory instruments we're considering now are just part of a broader package of statutory instruments uh, necessary to deliver the Incompetent Impairment Act. Uh, given the complexity of some of these instruments and the detail that's gone into, um, the government has consulted on them earlier this year. And I just wanted your view as to whether uh, that consultation has been broadly adequate, whether you feel that the um, responses that either you or others have, have put in have uh, informed the statutory instruments as they've uh, been the ones that have been placed before us just now and whether you're broadly content with that outcome. Okay, who'd like to um, go first on that one? Uh, Ian. Okay, I'll kick off then. Um, if I could focus on the asset transfer um, instruments because that's the one we've been most involved in, both in terms of our historic work, but um, I've also been involved in the working group that's been, trying, that's been producing the, the statutory guidance. Um, I mean, I think that as an act, you would have to say there's been lots of opportunities for consultation at different stages, probably more than the, the average act at the, the, in the Scottish Parliament. Um, in this latter part of the process, my sense is that um, there's been a bit more of a reaction from uh, local authorities and public bodies ag against asset transfer provision. Um, and I think that's led to a situation where, from what we've seen of the guidance, and obviously we just got sight of that fairly recently, um, it looks reasonable, but my concern would be that what you're facing is a wide range of attitudes in local authorities and public bodies, ranging from local authorities who totally get this, are up for this, we've been doing it for some time, to others that are far more uh, recalcitrant, I suppose. Um, my concern is that I think the, the guidance as it stands will work with the local authorities who are interested in doing this and want to do this and have been doing this. I'm much less convinced that it will challenge the, um, uh, the, the public bodies and local authorities that are less keen to engage in asset transfer. Okay, would anyone like to add further to that? It doesn't have to be specifically on asset transfer, but anyone want to add to that? Uh, yeah. Mr Wilson? Thank you, Convener. The Ian's outlined some of the concerns that have been raised regarding local authorities who are not as willing to participate in the community asset transfer process. And from the Glen Boyd perspective, uh, Glen Boyd has been involved in discussions for almost two years now with local authority about developing a, a community asset transfer policy uh, and looking at those with three organisations in North Lanarkshire. The difficulty is, is that that process stopped when they realised that the government were going to come out with their own guidance. And what my fear is, and uh, outlined by Ian, is that local authorities who are keen to fully participate, fully engage in this process, 
and work with communities who are interested in community asset transfers will do that job well. The difficulty is the other local authorities who are reluctant and resist that move. And when you look at some of the responses to the consultation that took place over the summer by local authorities and other public bodies, they seem to throw in a number of areas about the ownership of the land, about the, you know, what can be transferred and what shouldn't be transferred uh, to communities. The reality is, is the community asset transfer process and community empowerment was about trying to ensure that where communities could justify making application for community ownership, then the public bodies would work with those communities to help it happen. The difficulty that I see is that many agencies will actually use the consultation process and possibly use the guidance that will be issued to actually resist working with communities to look at community asset transfer, whether that be geographical communities or communities of interest. Okay, Mr. Shah, did you want to add to that? Sure, yeah. I mean, I, I'd say that, you know, the, there was been a very long lead-in, just to answer the question, there was a very long lead-in in, in terms of consultation around the community empowerment bill and then subsequently act. And I think there was a, a community empowerment reference group on which I was uh, a member as well that was set up two years in advance of when the, the act came into being. So very long, high level engagement and a lot of interest at the time. It was quite evident right from that point, from right from the start, that there was a quite fundamental shift, difference in uh, thinking between the local authorities and, and uh, community and voluntary organizations on the other side. And that, sh that split in thinking uh, you know, seem to be seem to carry on all the way through. So I'm not surprised when I hear colleagues, uh, Ian and others, say that you know there's been a bit of a, a pushback from local authorities and more you know more recently. One of the things that we 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 realised during the consultation for the bill itself was how much of an interest there was in uh, providing a facility for those local authorities that would be quite interested in. Uh, transferring assets or engaging more closely with their communities uh, to have vehicles and uh, mechanisms with which they could do that uh, legitimately and much more easily. Um, one of the problems we did identify at the time, and this was particularly in relation to participation requests, something which we, we kind of were a bit concerned about, was those local authorities that already had very good relationships with communities. If there was a more formal mechanism that was coming on board, there would be a little bit of a, a, a con we were a bit concerned that they might then say, right, hang on a second, we will prioritise uh, the formal mechanisms and some of the more informal conversations we're having with communities would then suffer as a result. And it's something which, uh, you know, I've just seen echoed in what John Wilson is saying as well around, uh, you know, the shift in priorities. And it, it's part of the, the kind of thinking, I, I, I would suggest, within uh, local authorities that where there is a more formal mechanism in play, then um, you know, there is an almost an expectation that you should put your energy and resources into that. So a little bit concerned that those local authorities that have advanced and had good relationships with communities, particularly around asset transfer, around participation and so on, uh, might get tempted away from that. And if the guidance is too prescriptive, then that, there is a danger there. Now, in terms of the guidance as it's been um, consulted on f uh, within the last couple of months or so, um, I, my concern is that we've not been able to get the same level of engagement and interest and enthusiasm in that level of detail as we have had during the build-up towards the community empowerment uh, bill in, in itself. So, it, so I, I do feel as though some of the provisions that are now coming out are kind of being done very much uh, more off the hoof and less uh, in you know, more considered engagement as had taken place for the bill itself. Thank you. Mary White, would you like to add, in, Wiley, add anything to that? So and just a general point, I suppose, just to echo some of what has already actually been said. I think there is a challenge. I, I would agree there's been a long run-up. We've had good opportunity to input. What I'm a wee bit concerned about is I know the effort that we put into Highland and actually going out and consulting specifically with community groups who have multitudes of questions around, right from the, the very introduction of the bill and, and the questions around that. I'm not convinced that there are people throughout the whole of Scotland who have confidence in terms of understanding the bill enough to actually go out and engage communities to educate them so that they're able to put forward the questions which could have influenced what was put in through the consultation. So I think for me there's been a bit of a gap in terms of how we educate people, particularly at this stage, once we get down to the finer detail. Um, Th those answers have certainly inspired a couple of supplementary um, questions from MSPs, but Andy, do you want to follow up with some of that first? Yes, <clears throat> no, thanks very much. I mean, I agree, obviously, this has been a long process and it's almost a bit exhausting at the end here, but at the end here we have the 
the instruments that make this work and will give communities the opportunity to actually utilise the Act for the first time. And so building on those answers, I mean, I mean, I'm just wondering in a general sense as well, if you look at participation requests, if you look at asset transfer, you know, the rules around this are complex and bureaucratic necessarily, so perhaps, given the Act. But picking up your point, Mary, um, working with communities, I mean, how, how important is it going to be to get um, a kind of easy to use guide to these powers? Um, because at first blush, communities are not going to look at a statutory instrument. Um, and they don't just have these powers, they have powers under other legislation, Land Reform Act, etc., to look at and to evaluate the best way forward. And informal approaches, of course, have always been a route. And how do you navigate um, a process whereby the local authority might be insisting that you use formal routes when informal routes might be more productive? Um, massively so. I mean, not just the guidance, but actually how they're supported to understand that and implement that. Um, communities are phenomenal, but they don't always always agree with each other, let alone anything else. So I think they need they need a lot of support within that. We're very lucky to have had support across agencies, specifically from DTAS, when we've been out engaging with communities. We need more collaborative support to make sure that they understand. But yeah, they need an easy to understand document that they can, to some extent, hold the, the local authority and other public authorities to account against. To that, Mr. Wilson, yes. Convener, just in terms of Mr. Whiteman's point about bureaucratic, the legislation, as I understand it, and someone who sat on that side of the, the committee uh, in the last session of Parliament, who went through the committee scrutiny of the legislation, what my interpretation of what we were attempting to do was to make it easier for communities to engage easier for communities to actually make requests for community asset transfers uh, so that, and not to make it too or overly bureaucratic. Because, the, as Mary said, the, the difficulty is, is when you start making things overly bureaucratic, then the bureaucrats take over. And communities want, have, in many cases, simple ambitions to be able to take on the running of, the ownership of, or the delivery of services within communities. And if you get half a situation where it does become overly bureaucratic to allow them to do that, then what you do is you then, in my view, frighten the communities from actually fully engaging and fully participating in that process. So it is about trying to make sure that what we have in place is legislation, which we have. It's the guidance that's in the, the, the statute instruments that are now being laid before Parliament. The legislation was quite clear. We want to make it easier for the community engagement to take place. If we get statutory instruments that make it more difficult and more bureaucratic, then that defeats the purpose of community empowerment and community engagement in the process. Okay, yeah, uh, Rukia, yeah. I think there's, there's three classes, three scenarios here. One is, one is those uh, local authority relationships where the local authority just does not want to transfer the assets or does not want to engage in the participation. And in that case, they will f easily find ways around any kind of guidance, any kind of uh, rules that are in play through the Community Empowerment uh, Act. Then there are those local authorities or departments of local authorities that are very keen and are very interested. They totally get the idea of um, enhancing and encouraging their communities to uh, make best use of the assets in the area or make, make best use of the opportunities to engage. And they will be doing it anyway, regardless of what the Community Empowerment Act might do. But it's the, it's the class, it's the scenario in the middle. It's those local authorities where there is a little bit of ambivalence, that there are some champions within the local authorities who totally get it, who want to support their communities, and there are others who remain to be convinced. For them, this can become a, a powerful tool for them to use, to say, well, actually, there is a route here we can follow, there's a process here we can use, and it can reassure uh, their, the, those that are less uh, inclined to, to follow along with it, to try and give it a shot. So it's, it's, that's where I think the most value of the provisions come into play. And I think that is where the guidance needs to speak to. OK, thank you. Mr Cook, do you want to add anything to that no, point? Not. OK. Uh, is it OK to move a couple of members in now for supplementary? So we'll take Graham Simpson followed by Ruth McGuire. Um, so th thanks for your opening comments. It's, uh, yeah, uh, it's very interesting, actually. Um, so I, I speak as a serving councillor in South Lanarkshire, where uh, a lot of this work's been going on already. Um, interested to hear about North Lanarkshire, because Mr Wilson, you're involved in a group which has taken over a community centre, I 
I understand. Is that right? We currently lease uh, on a month-to-month -month basis a, a, a former community centre that was run by the local authority. Uh, we run a number of services from that community centre, including the local post office, but it's only on a month-to-month -month lease basis. And if, if I'll go into detail later on about some of the issues that we've faced in terms of trying to move that forward from being just simply a lease to ownership of that building. Okay. Um, but from what you're all saying, um, the, the message I'm getting is that basically councils can use this legislation, use this guidance however they like. So therefore, the question is, is it robust enough? Uh, Mary Wiley, do you want to? I, just want it to, I think we need to expand it beyond councils, um, to be honest with you, because I, I, having spoken to a number of people in the community, it's not just council assets that they're looking at. So um, we need to be careful. Yes, councils will, but do you know the NHS potentially? How is it going to work within our national bodies like Police Scotland, Fire and Rescue, etc.? So I think we need to be careful of that. Okay, any additional comments from our witnesses? Mr Cook? Um, in answer to the question, is it robust enough? I would probably say at the moment, no. I mean, I, th I think it could be tightened up. I mean, if this exercise is about shifting power relationships between the communities and the wider public sector, then getting the guidance right, getting the detail right, as MSPs have said, is, is really crucial. Uh, and I'm not quite sure we've got the balance right. I think it will always be difficult because this is also about shifting minds and changing cultures within organisations and within communities, and that will take time. Um, but I think it's an opportunity to get the guidance tighter that would make it more robust. Okay, anyone else want to come in relation to that before we move on? Okay. Um, do you want to follow up on any more of that, Graham? Uh, yes, um, I'd like to know how you would make it tighter. Um, I think... Um, from what I've seen of the guidance, um, and I've only looked at it since the end of last week, uh, one of the most obvious areas, I think, uh, that if we don't get right, will lead to a lot of wasted time and effort by communities and potentially a lot of wasted uh, public money. Um, at the moment, um, there's what's called a validation date. So there's an informal process where the community can approach the public body over an asset, etc. Um, but Nothing really happens until there's a formal application from the community for an asset transfer request. And at that point, this validation date kicks in. And what that means in practice is that the asset in question cannot be then sold on in the intervening period until the process is concluded. The problem is to get to that point, community organisations are going to have to quite often change their governance, set up a company, they're going to do business plans, feasibility studies, options, appraisal exercise, a lot of work and effort, getting all these ducks in a line is quite a challenge. And in the meantime, the local authority or the public body could just go ahead and serve the asset, which does raise the question about, is this the best use of community's time? And secondly, who's going to fund that work if they know? I mean, is the Scottish Land Fund or the big lottery really going to fund that sort of feasibility business planning work if they know that at the end of the day, the local authority could just go ahead and sell that asset in the intervening period? OK, thank you. Um, can we perhaps move on, if that's OK, just now, Graham? Can I ask a very short you, you can, but after Ruth McGuire, who's indicated she wants to come in? Convener, um, I, I suppose it's exploring that type of thing a little bit more. Um, th there's al always going to be a bit of a tension between um, sort of balancing the bureaucracy, if you want to call it that, that's required to make sure that, that the, the transfer is going to be competent and it's going to be worked well, um, and empowering um, folk or, get, or giving communities that maybe are, don't have traditionally have the skills that are needed, like you said, setting up, you know, changing their governance, um, almost, you know, it's almost like running a business a lot of the time, taking taking over these things. So, I, I just want to explore a little bit more um, how we get to, to to a really good point where we've got because it is public assets we're talking about giving over, and, and whilst the, the the sound of doing things informally and, and quickly and easy. We need to do that. We also have to protect these public um, buildings and services. So what's the the kind of, I'd just like to hear your, your opinions on that, that kind of um, key bit. How do we make sure our communities are ready? Um, and, and, you know, yeah, that's it really. 
Okay. Um, Mary Wiley? Um, I can say that that's a question, the query that came up when we spoke to communities a lot. They're very conscious of the fact that if they or other members within their community are to take on these assets, then they want to make sure that there are processes there. I have to say they had no particular solutions around that. Um, I think it, we need to go back to basics and making sure that people have opportunities to develop their skill sets. Um, and that there's support there for them. And we need to have robust but fair processes for making sure that they're actually making effective use of those. Mr Wilson, yeah. Thank you, Convener. The, can I say that from the Glen Boy perspective, the community has been ready for almost 17 years to take on assets. Uh, we have attempted over the last nine years to acquire firstly the community centre, which we have the lease on, but when that fell through because of planning restrictions that were being placed upon the community, decided to look at another site and had, were involved in negotiations for five years with the local authority about a community asset transfer. Now, we're now back to looking at the community centre because the council came back and said, as part of their review of facilities, would you be interested in looking at the community centre? And we said, yes, that would be useful for us to do that. Can I say that in terms of public assets, the communities themselves are more than aware than anybody else about what public assets are and want to defend those public assets. When you're getting told a community centre is being used for 20 hours a week by a local authority, and that's how, how many hours a week they hire that out, and a community can take on the ownership of that. And at the present moment, the community centre in Glenboig is used for approximately 70 hours a week. So that shows you the balance that has got to be struck between talking about public assets and community ownership. And many communities throughout Scotland, they want to take on the ownership because they see the failings of the public bodies in relation to how these facilities or land has been operated. So it's about, the, the, I think communities themselves, and many communities throughout Scotland, do understand the very concept of public assets. Uh, and they want to ensure the best use of those assets are being achieved. And if that means taking on ownership, I think that's an, an opportunity that should not be uh, hope from actually moving forward. And I think it is about looking at that whole issue about the, the public asset and the community good that can be achieved by these asset, asset transfers. Um, now, Mr. Cook, what, uh, Mr. Cook, do you want to go and add to that? Did, did I see I mean, just, 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 back in just briefly, I think, I mean, yeah. it's, a, it's a good question, I think, and I don't think we've ever suggested that uh, asset transfer or community ownership should be easy, because you're right, there's a lot at stake, and it's important for the communities to get this right as it, as it, as it is for the public body who's dis disposing of the asset. Um, so I think what we talk about is sustainable asset transfer. So it, it's getting the process right that gives the, the disposing authority the confidence that this isn't going to bounce back in a year's time or two years' time or whatever. But over the last 10, 15 years in Scotland, we've actually accrued a lot of experience about how to do this, really. And the success rate is, is I think, kind of impressively high. Certainly a lot you know, uh, higher than, say, the sort of um, startup of private sector businesses, etc. So I don't think it should be easy, but I think it has to be fair and it has to be proportionate. And really, if this bill or this act is about empowering communities, we can't really have them run around the place doing all sorts of work that might ultimately lead to nothing. That's going to disempower communities rather than empower communities. So there's something quite fundamental at the heart of this discussion. Mr. Shah, yes. I, I think the answer might actually lie outside the Community Empowerment Act and guidance. Um, Scotland recently has uh, been selected to be a pioneer in the Open Government Partnership, which means that for over the next two years, Scotland will directly be able to showcase how it is being open, transparent, participative, um, and uh, engaging uh, to a global audience. So there's a, there's a bit of a, a momentum and in incentive behind that, certainly at Scottish government level now. And what I would say is if you, if you think about asset transfers, participation requests, and all the, the various instruments within the Community Empowerment Act, if at the same time you also had a very open approach, so for example, decisions made by the public authorities around their assets were much more transparently and openly uh, shared with the communities, with the, with the public, if the data that is available, that is fed into the decisions that are being made uh, by the public authorities is openly shared in a much more transparent way. If all of these decisions, engagements are much more transparently 
show, then the harsh, hard light of day will then easily show up where, where a decision has been made merely in response to the fact that community is, is seeking to own, uh, to, to, to uh, have an tra asset transfer of a building, if, if that is the reason why suddenly the, uh, a public authority decides to sell a building, or alternatively, if it is actually a much better approach to sell that uh, um, asset uh, in cost effective, then if it is a much more transparent and open process that's, that's around that and everybody knows what the, the situation is, then the community itself will be much more able to decide whether it should invest those resources into uh, exploring whether it should uh, you know, do a feasibility study and so on. So I think uh, the, this, this entire uh, provision in combination with an open government approach at local and public authority level might be the trick that's missing from here. Thank you. Ruth McGuire? Really um, interesting answers, and I, I think just to um, reflect on, on, on what John Wilson said, I know certainly within my own um, constituency there are examples of um, a community who have taken a huge amount of time through no, no fault of their own, but they have, they have got there now. But equally, sometimes when we talk about um, community or voices of community, it, it's not always um, reflective of the whole area it's sometimes people with the skills and the confidence to make their voices heard so it's just getting that that balance to make sure when we're talking about um what the community wants that that it is um it is reflective of the whole community and i think that getting that the balance of that process right is is crucially important now uh, i think because you name checked mr wilson we should ask mr wilson um how you make sure that you're actually representative of the whole community not just those who seek to be involved the Glen Boyk has regularly held uh, surveys uh, amongst its population in Glen Boyk. We do open days, we don't have any plans uh, for the last, as I said, nine, over nine years now. Uh, we have any plans that we've had for the community regarding new facilities or services, then certainly these plans have been made available and uh, the local community have had the opportunity to come and view them. Uh, that's been uh, displayed amongst the various groups that we help support. So the views and aspirations of those individuals and groups can then be reflected in what we're trying to achieve. So there is a balance there in terms of ensuring that communities, the wider community is being consulted, informed, and being able to participate in the process. Uh, we also have an annual general meeting, which uh, you know, the population in Glen Boyg are invited to attend uh, so they can express their concerns or views or hear what's happening in the community. And we also pr provide regular newsletters. Now, I know that every community group doesn't do that, and I, I agree with Ms Maguire that, uh, given my past work experience, that it is good practice to do that. Uh, and make sure that if you are speaking on behalf of a community, the community know you're speaking on their behalf, and that way they can be reflected in the, the views and opinions that are being put forward. But clearly, the, if you look at some of the, and I would throw to the other side, if you look at public agencies and local authorities and the things that they have done to communities without any consultation, then hopefully this is a lesson that can be learned on both sides not only by the community, but by public agencies, that they have to be more forthcoming in terms of the consultation processes that they use when they're doing things to communities. Yeah, that's a very appropriate point. Mr Wilson, Mary Wiley, did you want to come back on some of that? I just a quick point, because we spoke to over 100 community organisations and community representatives around this act, and I have to say this was the number one issue. There is no easy solution to it. It becomes even more difficult when you start to talk about communities of interest or association, other than just territorial geographic communities. Um, but I do think it's something that we as support mechanisms for communities need to be very strong on. Um, there's not going to be a perfect answer to it, but it'll have to be unique to each community. I don't know if Mr Shah or Mr Cook wants to add anything in relation to that. Mr Cook, yeah. Yeah, I mean, just briefly, I mean, again, I think it's a good observation. and There's no easy answer to it, but if a community is trying to utilise either the community right to buy or asset transfer, they have got to demonstrate public support. And in some cases, that's quite a, an undertaking to do that, really. Um, I think, um, as, as, as Mary said, I think it is about sort of sharing good practice or whatever. Um, but also within the within the, the, the guides, it's quite clear about what sort of community bodies. And I think the point John makes is that there has to be some sort of democratic accountability mechanism built into the sort of bodies that can take on assets, and particular public assets. So I, I think we've got the sort of framework right. 
communities are by definition quite messy. I think that you will get tensions, etc. But um, I think we can share good practice and build on that. And I, I don't think for me that's a particular sort of showstopper. I think there's other sort of more technical issues that, that we need to kind of try and focus on. So, Shad, do you want to add anything? No, it's working. Okay, thanks. Do you want to follow before I move on? Do you want to follow up on anything? Yeah. Um, you wanted to come in briefly earlier, ladies. Really, the moment passed, or do you want to come in now? No, I think I could yeah. still ask. I also want to ask about the, the participation, but I don't think you've quite moved on but, to well, that maybe yet. Maybe to so Alexander yeah, Stewart so before I'll, you move on to I'll that. I'll briefly ask uh, Mr Cook maybe what somebody said earlier. Um, you expressed concern, Mr Cook, earlier about... Oh, sorry, and I should say thank you to all the witnesses for coming, since it's the first time I've, I've asked any. Um, you expressed concern earlier about maybe if a community is going to go through the whole process of trying to, to take over the asset, the asset transfer, and meanwhile the, the local authority or the public body sells it. Would, th then, would there then be some kind of case for, if you reach a certain point, that it should be frozen? Is that something that could be... We, we, we could look at whether that sh yeah, would be applicable. Yeah, that's, that's, that's right. I mean, at the moment, it's quite far into the process where the asset's frozen. Mm -hmm. And it just seems to me, to, for the community to get to that point, they've got to invest an incredible amount of effort and energy, probably access quite a lot of public money for a, a venture that could ultimately be quite successful. And I mean, just to give you one example, I got a phone call this week from one of our members, I was telling you it's in Glasgow, um, and it's a development trust, very experienced, own, own other properties, etc. There's been a janitor's house lying vacant for 10 years in that community. Um, the development trust were speaking to a local school, come up with a project that they both think could benefit the school and the community. The um, development trust then contacted the local authority and said, here's what we're thinking, what's the situation? And the response was to put that house immediately up for sale and to market it. Now, that, I think, reflects some of the attitudes that this bill has got to take on. So I think that that's an experienced development trust in that sort of situation. If we're thinking of less experienced organisations, particularly in disadvantaged areas, then we've, we've, we've got to give them a fighting chance. And I think that the point of where the, the asset's frozen is, is crucial, I think, to, to getting this uh, bit of legislation right. Again, if, if a community have been using an asset, for example, as John Wilson outlined to Glenbog Neighbourhood House, that it's a month to month, you know, it would, it would seem then that if they were to, if they were expressing an interest, it, it, it wouldn't seem fair if the local authority were to then suddenly decide that that asset should be commercially sold mm. off. So, that, you know, is that the kind of thing too that you might be thinking about? Absolutely. I mean, if um, Mark McRitchie had been here this morning from Community Central Halls in Glasgow, They've um, ran an organisation uh, from what was formerly Methodist Halls and Mary Hill Road in Glasgow for, I think it's something like 20 odd years. And uh, they've poured lots of money that they've raised themselves to try and keep the board and wind and water tight, to develop it, etc. A number of years ago, they asked the local authority if they could buy the asset because they put a lot of investment into it and it made a lot of sense. Um, the council said yes. Um, so you had a willing buyer, a willing seller, there was no kind of problem about the, the price. Five years later, that still not happened. I, I don't know what happens in these sort of situations, but there just seems to be inbuilt blocks within the, the culture or the, or the mechanisms of, of particularly some local authorities and some public bodies that operate against this. And again, that's what this guidance needs to be able to, to address. Uh, also, Elaine, you've given me the opportunity with Mr Cook mentioning Mark McGritch. I should have mentioned at the outset that we were hoping Mark could come along today. He's the Chief Executive of Community Central Halls in Glasgow, uh, an, an organisation I know very well and I, I commend the work that they do. Thank you for uh, mentioning that. And also, you can perhaps tell me after the meeting, I wonder if that janitor's house is in my constituency, because I either it's in my constituency or, or I know a very similar situation elsewhere within Glasgow, possibly. Mr Wilson, again, I think you were name-checked. Do you want to come back in and add before we move on? Just to follow up on what Ian said, the, the, at the point that a community declares an interest in either land or premises, then that, I would argue, is the point that the local authority or public body should then put a phrase on that to say that the community interest has been declared. Because in terms of some of the responses that we saw in the consultation process over the summer, the local authorities and other public bodies are talking about feasibility studies, business plans, valuations having to be carried out, uh, and that's the community organisations or community groups having to carry that out to take forward the business case for acquiring that asset. That all takes money, 
it all takes time to actually acquire that money and it takes time for that work to be undertaken. So if, as the, the example is a good example that Ian highlighted, if a local authority is then made aware that there is a, a vacant property or a piece of land, that they then just decide to put it on the, mar on the market, then that defeats the whole purpose of the community em empowerment and that community being able to uh, acquire that asset for the community benefit. Is there, Mr. Ross, is there a period of time you would suggest in terms of like three months, six months? I don't know how long is a piece of string, but I'm just thinking out loud in relation to uh, lots of communities may make an initial, initial declaration of interest and not have the capacity or the support to follow up and to put a freeze in a whole range of assets. So would it be three months, six months? Are you thinking about a kind of cool-off period where the council could not market that land or property? What would the balance be, do you think? It's all of those convener, and not the th the, either three months or six months or a cool-off period. It's really a, my view would be if the community have identified an asset potential asset transfer, the local authority should take that on board and should work with and assist uh, that community group to uh, go through the hoops that they're being asked to go through by that local authority. Because as I said, I do to do a feasibility study, to do a business plan, and to make sure that the group are able and capable of actually moving forward will take time. Uh, so the, whether that, that piece of string is three months or six months or even 12 months, uh, it's whether or not the local authority or public body then basically declares that land to be frozen or asset to be frozen until such times as the community group has the wherewithal to either come back and say, we are interested in taking this forward, we've got the resources to do that, we can provide all the information that's required, or the community to come back and say, look, we've had a look at the business case for this, it's not working for us, and we're quite willing for the local authority to de de dispose of that in a any way they want. Uh, that's part of the difficulty, though, is that in many cases it's when the community identify a piece of land or an asset it's when that's when the local authority finally realises, well, that's on our books. We need to uh, think about selling that or making some uh, capital gain out of that. That's Thank you very much, Mr. Wilson. I, I do want to can move on. Uh, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Convener, and thank you very much for the answer so far. I think it's been very relevant. Uh, as a serving councillor in Perth and Can Ross, uh, I certainly have seen the massive engagement and the excitement that communities have when they have the opportunity. Uh, but that sometimes leads to frustration because of the complex issues that they then become involved in. As you've already said, one size does not fit all. Uh, and they've seen something be successful somewhere and think, well, we can do the same. And then they find that there's more obstacles, there's more, uh, and that becomes then disappointment. And then you get a bit of disillusionment. Uh, uh, so I, I understand the, the need and the opportunity that we have with the guidance uh, for where we are. But I, I'm not quite sure how we get through that. Uh, because, as I say, you know, I've seen two groups trying to do the same thing. Uh, and one's been very successful, and the other one has not got at all forward uh, and become really frustrated by the process uh, and think that, that, that the, the whole process is not working for them. Uh, so it's how you manage that. And, and I think that the guidance needs to still be involved much more to try and give them a flavour of what they might anticipate and expect. Uh, because, as you say, if the... If the local government or the health board or housing, whoever it has control of it, uh, doesn't want to give uh, control away uh, in some respect, uh, then the frustration then moves forward. So, so how, how can we try and square that circle uh, and ensure that you know, there's a good response and there's a good outcome uh, for the communities? Uh, because as I say, I've seen ones that have been so excited and so enthusiastic and it's worked well, and others who have just been so turned off and frustrated because of the... Uh, regulations that they've now find themselves in, in boiled in. That brings us back to the details of the guidance again, so Mr Stewart, which is, which is helpful. So how, how can we change or review the guidance? If, if this guidance comes into force, how would we perhaps review it to maybe develop it at some point in the future? Or your thoughts on that would be welcome. I know Mr Cook previously mentioned a lack of robustness in some areas. Mr Shad, did you want to come in and make some comments. Yeah, sure. I mean, I suppose, you know, the, the, what, there is definitely a case for strengthening the guidance and possibly even strengthening regulations off the back of that as required. But the danger we don't, we should probably be aware of not falling into is merely using, having to chase bad practice by issuing more and more regulations, more and more guidance, because that takes you in a, in a towards more bureaucracy, 
which will then might work for one or two cases, but for everyone else it just becomes uh, quite bureaucratic. And the danger, of course, is that those public authorities that are genuinely don't want to play ball will always find a way around this and, and it'll just then create endless bureaucracy for everybody else as we try and introduce more regulations. I do genuinely think that, as I referred to below before, that the, uh, the open approach, so for example, strengthening freedom of information requests, speeding up the publication of decisions and minutes and things like that, um, the open decision making, that kind of thing, I think has a very strong part to play here because if you take the case of the janitor's house, if uh, the public authority, the local authority, knew that they would have to um, explain their decisions or they would have to display their decision-making very publicly, they might think twice about uh, taking that decision. And if they did take that decision, they would need to be really confident that the decision they made was actually in the best interest of the community more widely. OK, thank you. Mr Cook, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a good question. It's one of the challenges around this, this area of activity. Um, we've got sort of 240 members throughout Scotland and you know, we get phone calls at different points in the process from different groups at different stages. I mean, it seems to me that there's things we can do within the guidance and there's things that are beyond the guidance, but we've also got to kind of not lose sight of really. I mean, I think, um, as I was saying earlier, I, I don't think it should be an easy process. I mean, I think that what you're trying to do is test whether there's a credible proposition from the community. And I think that part of all our jobs, um, and I think the guidance helps with this, is that communities go into this with their eyes open, so they know the implications of this, they know how much voluntary effort is going to be required as opposed to staffing, etc. They're clear about the business plan. For me, that's the key thing. I mean, I just think that, 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 that too often the, that the business plans are quite weak. Uh, and, and sometimes local authorities themselves are not the best readers of business plans, in my experience, I would have to say as well. Um, I think that... Um, but with the, the actual guidance itself, we've also got to, if we're, if, if we're serious about, and it seems to me that the Scottish Government is increasingly is placing greater expectations on communities, we have got to keep investing in communities and ensuring that there's a, the kind of support around communities to make sure that these endeavours are long term and, and they are sustainable. Mary or... Um Anyone else want to win? Yeah, Mary Bailey. Yeah, I just want to echo what Ian's really said. Um, there are elements that you can tighten up within the guidance, but there needs to be things that sit in within the, the entire act, the whole ethos, the policy, if you go back to the, what the principal's talking about. We need community development. We need to invest in community development and in communities themselves. Um, we need to make sure that the guidance does allow for that credibility of community voice um, I, I had an experience actually working with DITAS a wee while ago. We were working with the community, and part of the reason that they struggled to get anything going was the fact that they had a very small number within the actual community. The community itself wasn't bought into the principle. They couldn't develop their business plan. So it's it's that it, it's supporting communities to make sure that they actually have the full buy-in from the whole community. And I think there are things within the guidance you can do to strengthen that. But outside of that, I think there's there's more that needs to be done. Uh, Mr. Wilson, and then we'll move on to the, ne the next question. Go back to Mr. Stewart's original question about the expectations of communities and the example we gave of two organisations in Perth and Kinross, one that had a good experience, one that had a bad experience. There is also a learning uh, curve for public authorities as well and local authority staff, because it's not good enough just to say that the communities who want to engage in this process have to be trained and have to be sufficiently knowledgeable about what they want to do. There is also work has to be done in terms of public authorities about their staff understanding what this legislation, the Act, is about and what we're hoping to achieve through the legislation and what was envisaged through the legislation was greater community empowerment. If we have resistance in public agencies or local authorities to community asset transfer at whatever level, then that can cause barriers to be created for the communities themselves from acquiring those assets. So it's not, it might not just be the chief executive or the council leader. It might be somewhere down in the machinery uh, that is actually saying, you know what, I'm not really keen in transferring this asset. I see a better use of that, this asset for something else rather than giving it to the community op to operate. So it's about trying to ensure that as well as communities being informed and trained and sufficiently knowledgeable, it's also about local authorities and public agencies being suitably knowledgeable about what the objectives of this legislation that's set out are, and that is about giving communities greater influence and greater control 
over what is delivered within their communities. Okay, thank you, Mr. Wilson. We've got about just under 10 minutes left for questions. A couple of MSPs still want to come with, with themes. Possibly a third MSP. We might take you back in, Andy, if there's time, but Kenneth Gibson, MSP, just now. Okay. Thank you, uh, uh, convener. I mean, we're all supportive, uh, I believe, in this room of uh, community empowerment and community ownership uh, where possible. And I'm sure everyone would agree that the initiative for community ownership should come from the community itself. But in the area that uh, Ruth and I represent a few years ago, uh, the local authority decided more or less unilaterally to try and offload community assets onto communities who simply uh, not only were not prepared for that, but had no desire to take on those assets um, for a whole variety of reasons, which I'm sure you'd be familiar with. So what kind of advice can we give to communities in those circumstances? What kind of support can we, can we give them? OK, uh, Mr Wilson. Thank you. I think I know the case Mr Gibson is referring to about a transfer of an asset that was running at a half million pound annual loss uh, that was to be uh, the local authority decided to transfer over to a community in the hope that they would be able to run it uh, and take on that debt. The reality is, is about, and this is where it goes back to the sustainability, the, the business plan, and looking at the, the assets themselves and whether or not you do have a community group that is fully versed and what they're being, if in the case of the example given by Mr Gibson, where they were being offered a, an asset transfer by a local authority. At the end of the day, all the information has got to be made available to community organisations if they are going to take on an asset and what is actually involved in taking on that asset. And it's not just about, as we, the example given, about local authorities deciding to dispose of assets and we'll just give it to the community. If we can't run it... A, a, a profit, uh, then the community can take on the, res the liability and the responsibility for running those facilities. Uh, so it is about ensuring that any community organisation is fully aware of the, any of the, the issues that may arise from taking on, and that really comes into looking at the business case for taking on an asset uh, and ensuring that is viable. Okay, uh, Mr Cook, did you want to come in? I think, I think one of the strengths of, of the Act um, is that it's any asset and the community can make a, a bid for any asset and I think that kind of mitigates against the danger of um, the public sector just trying to dispense of their liabilities um, as opposed to assets. I mean, part of the work that we do, which is funded by the Scottish Government, is to encourage community organisations to make a critical choice and understand, is this a, an, a, an asset, is it a liability, could the liability be made an asset, and in some cases it, it, it could be, and I think we've got some really good examples of turning that around. I mean, in my experience, communities kind of work around market failure, either pro private, private sector market failure or public sector market failure. Um, so it, it's, it's quite challenging, and, and I think you've got to go into it with, with your eyes open, as I've as I've said, and I think as John's pointed out, critical is, is the business plan. If you can't make it stack up, if you haven't got the capacity to do this, then you shouldn't be going anywhere near it, really. So sometimes a good outcome for us is the community exploring it and then coming to a conclusion that actually it's not for them, or there's maybe another asset that would be better suited for their purposes. Only because of time constraints. Um, if Ms Wiley or Mr Shah doesn't need to come in on this, can we get some of that dialogue back and forward to help with scrutiny? If, that, if that's OK, if the burning issue you must raise, please do let me know. But I know Mr Gibson wanted to follow up on Just that. a short follow-up. It was actually about you know something six, seven years ago, North Ayrshire Council decided that in order to reduce its own liabilities and to actually uh, help with its uh, budgetary uh, issues, it would just simply say to communities, yeah, either you take over the community centre or... Uh, it's going to close and they basically put a gun at their heads now. Obviously, there was a furore about that and, uh, you know, these things didn't actually come to pass. But I'm obviously concerned that with this legislation uh, and, and local authorities and other bodies being under continued pressure, there could be a push for organisations that are not ready. And it's just how we can uh, cushion communities because what we want to do is encourage people to take over assets where they have the potential and the community capacity to do so. But on the uh, counter to that, we don't want people to be pushed over a cliff and at the end of the day, the asset could, in fact, potentially be lost because well, the public body doesn't want it and the community is not ready to, to, uh, to take it on board. Uh, Kenny, I think that's a really... Uh, Mr Shab, I think that's a really helpful point that you're, you're making. I, I'm not, not sure whether uh, uh, th there are specific answers to that other than agreeing with the point. But in Mr Shah, then we might move to the next line of questioning, if, that, if that's OK, Mr Shah. I think the key thing there is the fury. 
you know, so the, the fury was there because it became public knowledge that uh, that's what the, the plan was to try and offload assets that needed to be enhanced and possibly, you know, offloaded to communities where could they, they could then bring in big lottery money, whatever it might mean, to, to uh, you know, repair and enhance the assets. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, the core of the question, I mean, if, if there is uh, a facility, an obligation for the public authority um, on request to share any information, any kind of feasibility studies they have commissioned about uh, the assets that they hold uh, on request from the community, so are looking at a particular asset or building, then suddenly that you're starting to open up uh, the conversation a bit more and the community in question can make it a, a better informed choice on whether it is worth them going down that route or indeed they need to demonstrate that even with knowledge of uh, an assessment done by the, the authority, they still want to pursue this because there is still an advantage there to pursuing it and repairing the asset and, and so on, then that should still be uh, acceptable. But it's, the key thing here is that conversation needs to be opened up, the documentation, the analysis, the data, all of that needs to be shared much more openly. I think that's the key. Is it also reasonable to, to assume that we shouldn't assume that something is a liability just because a local authority or other public body is losing money because they've not been run as a business and I'm thinking of Cadder Community Centre in my constituency where Glasgow Life put the padlocks on and a few months later we took the padlocks off along with the local housing association and by definition saved the local authority money by because they disinvested from the local community. That was never intended to be run as a profit. So should we be expecting local authorities or other public bodies, if the asset is going to be continued to be used for community benefit, not just to be passing the asset to the community, but also providing a dowry or a revenue running cost to some of that. I'm, and I'm sneaking in here ahead of you, Elaine, but I'm just wondering if that's an important thing to put on the record, or has that happened elsewhere, or should it be happening? Mr I Cook. It's weird, and I think it's really helpful. I mean, what we were trying to get to is not... Uh, the problem this morning, it sounds as though it's kind of quite confrontational. We're trying to get to a point where we have a constructive dialogue between the public sector and the community sector, and we know respective strengths, and we come up with solutions for particular projects. So I think that suggestion should be on the record, because there's examples of it helping, particularly short term, um, and, and certainly seems uh, it, it changes the mindset of the local authority. It's not just about getting rid of the assets, it's about how do we work with this. And it's, a, it's a redefining the partnership with the community to try and make this work in the longer term. I indulge myself to put that on the record. So thank you, Mr Cook. And I should point out that £1.2 million pounds later from the Scottish Open Regeneration Fund, the community has a new community centre with the housing associations that anchor tenant because the community got involved in trying to save what they saw as a community asset, which is a real win. Elaine, my apologies. This will have to be the final question, I'm afraid. Elaine Smith. Okay, which I think probably brings me quite nicely into it anyway, and it's about the, 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 the section on participation requests, which I don't think we've really covered particularly, but I was interested in, and I thank John Wilson and Glen Boyd Neighbourhood House for um, giving us the annual report and the section in that about consultation. Um, I know a bit about that, having been the constituency member for that area and now regional list member, um, so I'm aware of that particular consultation pro um, that's mentioned in the annual report. But following on from that, then, I wonder um, how, if I can specifically ask John Wilson, how the community participation requests might work from that, and, and would, would there be a lot of unfunded costs around that for community groups? Uh, John, just before you come in, and I'll, I'll, I'll allow you to come a supplementary that as well, Elaine, but if the other witnesses have maybe some final remarks around that as well, now would be a good time to make it, because we're, we're getting very short for time. Sorry, John. John Wilson. No, it's OK, convener. The, the issue about participation requests, the, the issue you've seen from, and the, part of the reason for submitting the annual report, shows that Glen Boyd Neighbourhood House is in, involved in delivering a range of services, and some of those services are delivered by the Neighbourhood House uh, standalone in terms of childcare services, elderly services, uh, but some of the other services are delivered in conjunction with the local authority and the health board. So in terms of participation requests, then the Glen Boy has, has made, uh, is actively involved in the, and actually run some of the services that are being run Colt Bridge wide. Uh, so we've got a good relationship, but it's trying to ensure that that relationship is maintained and that other communities have that opportunity to be engaged in that. Because earlier we talked about the liabilities, and Convener, you made reference to your example of the liabilities in a community facility that the community took on 
and then we're able to turn that around. In many respects, community participation could actually see better delivery of services within communities uh, and could actually be more beneficial to local authority to the, and the general well-being of the population if communities are allowed to get in, involved in the decision-making and the participation process that local authorities are actually making in their own areas. Do you want, before I bring another witness in, do you want to come back on some of that, Elaine? No, I think it's obviously a very interesting example. Um, but I suppose in general for the other witnesses, just to want to ask whether um, there's, there's anything which should be covered by the, the participation request process that's not maybe included in the draft regulations and just to get their views. Yeah, um, OK, so this might be the last opportunity you have to speak, so feel free to add on anything else that you haven't felt you've been able to say on the record so far. So, Mr Cook, we'll take you first. Um, I think in response to the question, what I would say is that it seems within this particular um, measure of the, the Act that there are two things that maybe need to be disentangled. There's the right to, part right to participation, so the right for information, the right to be engaged or whatever, and that's great. But, but within the, the right, there's also the right for communities to request to deliver or co-deliver a particular service, which I, I suppose relates to sort of John's particular experience, really. For us, that's the more exciting part, because that seems to be the kind of new part of the act, really. And I do think that perhaps the guidance would benefit from disentangling both these issues. Uh, uh, Ms Miley? Yeah, just a couple of points. Um, when we've done our engagement work around the community and permit that, this is a section of the act that they are most interested in. And without a doubt, even explaining all of the points that you just picked up on that spectrum that they could potentially use it to get involved in, they have dived straight into good delivering services. So that's the part that they are focused on. What I don't think that we've done enough yet to really get over is this outcome improvement process, and that's what you're actually asking to participate in. That is by nature a very public sector, a very bureaucratic way to phrase it and I think we need to break down some barriers around what does that actually mean and how does that apply in terms of what I'm trying to do um, but I think it's a very exciting aspect of the Act I'm looking forward to seeing how it works in practice. And Mr Shah? Perhaps a slightly more blunt version of what Maria said but uh, when we first saw the uh, proposals for putting in the participation requests in the outcome not, not the delivery site the, the, the request to participate in the outcomes um, we were quite concerned that this almost seemed like you know a request to be heard and it jarred quite a bit. You know, are we at the stage within local authority engagement with communities that we have to actually have a, a process where people need to be requested to be even heard? So it jarred quite a bit there. We were also, I, I think I mentioned, might have mentioned earlier that, you know, quite concerned that those departments within public authorities that already have a very good relationship um, could, this could kind of like draw the energy away from it because, you know, uh, civil servants and officials would feel the need to focus their energy on those areas that had a much more formal process. Having said that, it is still quite early days to see that there's potentially a lot of value where there are uh, much more bureaucratic uh, uh, authorities in play where they, they need to have a much more formal process in order to even get a conversation started. It is very early at this stage to tell how that's going to pan out and I suspect we will need to revisit guidance in this area over the next year and the coming years. Can I just uh, finally check with witnesses, given the fact that these statutory entities do, do come to this committee, whether you would be content for them to come into force, but with the caveat that uh, this is not the end of the story and it has to be reviewed and monitored going forward. And I'm not trying to put words into your mouth, but eventually it does come to this committee and that's why we're doing the scrutiny. So would you be content, with all the caveats given, uh, would you be content for them to come into force or otherwise? It'd just it'd be good to get an indication of that. I don't, Mr Cook? Um, if there was possibility for them still to be tweaked before that happens, we would be quite supportive of that. But certainly, I, I think the suggestion of maybe reviewing them after a, a period of time to look at where the, the weaknesses are would probably be quite welcome as well. OK, uh, Ms Wiley? Yeah, by and large, um, I would also point out that there's other things that need to sit alongside them, which is noted in the paper and the yeah. practicalities of it, but yes. Of course. Uh, Mr Shah? Yeah, I think the review is quite important, continuous review of this. OK, Mr, Mr Wilson. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that all the SSIs have to be taken together yeah. and looked at, uh, rather than just piecemeal adoption of the SSIs. And like others have said, the, this should be under constant review, uh, particularly by this committee in relation to the legislation. 
and I'm sure we'll want to, to do that. Very helpful evidence session. Can I thank all of our, our witnesses for attendance this morning? Can I also just put on the record that we will also be taking evidence for a number of public bodies, Police Scotland, Highlands Islands Enterprise, NHS Ayrshire and Arran, SPT and Scottish Natural Heritage at our meeting on the 23rd of November. So thank you uh, once again. Uh, that, that concludes this agenda item. Can we suspend briefly before we move on? Thank you.
Okay, good good morning everyone, and uh, we now move to agenda item two, which is ba draft budget scrutiny 2017-2018. The committee will take evidence from a number of witnesses on the Scottish Government's draft budget 2017-2018, and given that the draft budget has yet to be published, the committee has agreed to undertake pre-budget scrutiny looking back at what was actually been spent in 2015-16 and to the extent possible um, uh, future years. This is the second of two evidence sessions on pre-budget scrutiny. This session will focus on housing aspects of the draft budget, and we have a, a large witness panel uh, this morning, which I'm uh, uh, delighted to see. So we have Nicola Barclay, Chief Executive Homes for Scotland, Mary Taylor, Chief Executive Scottish Federation of Housing Associations, David Bookbinder, Director of Glasgow and Western Scotland Forum of Housing Associations, Tony Kane, Policy Manager, Association of Local Authorities and Chief Executive Chief, Chief Housing Officers, rather. Fraser Stewart, Director of New Gorbals Housing Association. Julie Fitzpatrick, Managing Director of the Rising Housing Association. And Professor Kenneth Kiff, Director of Policy Scotland, University of Glasgow. Just make sure there's no one else on my other sheet there that I've missed out. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for, for coming along. Um, we were, we, we, some very specific questions that, that we want to ask you is, uh, as, as the evidence session goes on. Um, but um, I should um, perhaps just open up by saying one of the few areas in the Scottish Government budget where we anticipate a significant financial commitment given the, the other budget pressures that are around uh, the Scottish budget would be housing. Um, that, that seems to be clear. So we're quite interested to know initially what the opportunities are in relation to maximising the benefit for affordable housing from that budget. And perhaps that's a good place to open up. And as we as we go through that, we can look at some of the challenges to make sure that happens. So we'd like to start with what the opportunities are or what they have been from previous budgets also. Uh, Mary Taylor. Yes, I, well, first of all, can I commend the uh, commitment to um, increasing the amount of investment going into housing? I think it's very welcome and helps to restore some of where we were before with a steady housing supply um, and a, a fairly stable system. And I think some of our, uh, I think all of our evidence will, will highlight some of the difficulties that we all face in trying to get back to where we were in terms of the, the, the impact of the disruption um, on, uh, on, on our current practice. But there's no question that the commitment to investment over a five year period um, and at a rate which helps to achieve affordable rents that are affordable to the people who need to live in them um, is hugely welcomed by, by all and sundry and, is, and bears out, I think, the research that was commissioned by the uh, SFHA, Shelter and CIH, the professional body for housing, uh, about the extent of the unmet need in Scotland, which identified that there was an unmet need of 60,000. So a target of 50,000 is not quite the 60,000, but I don't want to be drawing the short straw on this occasion. I think if we can get to the 50,000, we'll be doing really well. OK, thank you. Um, Mr Bookbinder? As Mary said, the, the commitment to 50,000 homes, uh, along with the increased grant rates, uh, is, is, is hugely welcome. You asked about opportunities, and I suppose to cut to the chase from, from the forum's point of view, one of the real opportunities here, along with the scale and the numbers game that obviously has to be uh, uh, played as part of uh, achieving that target, there's an opportunity to, to align the, the broader Scottish Government direction of policy in terms of empowering communities, uh, an issue obviously you've just been uh, discussing in the previous session, with, with this, this major house building programme. And there's the, we have some anxieties that that, 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 that opportunity may be being missed in, in some parts of, of, of Scotland in terms of uh, maximising the role of, of, of those organisations, community controlled housing associations, that have played a role for so long in the, in the wider regeneration of those communities. That's, that is a real opportunity to align those two things. It's early on in the programme, we've certainly got some anxieties uh, that, that uh, 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 community controlled associations uh, are being squeezed out at the current stage. Okay, oh. make a back to on that. Sure. Back to make that. a back to that, Mr Bookbinder, at some point. Any additional comments in relation to the opportunities? Uh, Julie Fitzpatrick. Um, I think we, we think there 
um, this is the first time, to our knowledge, that the, a Scottish draft budget has made an explicit acknowledgement of the contribution that accessible homes, as well as affordable homes, can make to addressing poverty and health inequalities. Um, and so in, in, in that context, there's a real opportunity to then look at um, how those 50,000 homes that are delivered um, really are built and shaped with some national direction to link into the national health and well-being outcomes. So that's a terrific opportunity. Our concern, and hopefully we'll get a bit more chance to, to talk about that later this morning, is that what there isn't perhaps is the corollary of a focused investment to deliver that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Mr Gibb. Professor Gibb, sorry. Uh, I just wanted to really add that you used the word ben benefits, and I think there are important economic benefits. Uh, we, we know that there are big multipliers attached to investment in, in housing and house building and construction in, in general. But more than that, my, my colleague Duncan McLennan often talks about uh, housing as what he calls essential economic infrastructure. The idea that if you build new housing supply, social, affordable and private uh, housing, you are able to sustain greater economic growth in the future because you're you're supporting the uh, locations where people want to live. You're protecting, you know, you're 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 giving people a reason to stay somewhere. You're attracting new new people in, in, into an area. But more more to the point, as far as the Scottish government's concerned, you're creating t you're creating a tax base. You know, you're you're creating potential tax 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 revenue by by that investment as well, which obviously in the future is going to be much more important. Okay, thank you, Professor Gibb. Any, anyone else want to come on the opportunities, Mr Cain? If, if, if I may, I, I think that, well, I would echo much of what has already been said, and certainly the local authority sector welcomes the, the medium-term commitment, welcomes the increase in grant levels, welcomes the support and the very strong commitment that the Scottish Government has given around affordable and particularly social rented housing. If we have a concern, if I have a concern, it's that these are organisations that plan on a 30-year horizon and they're involved in delivering an asset with a 100-year, at least a 100-year uh, um, life. A five-year planning horizon is all very well, but as we sit, the sector is still recovering and doing its best to gear up from a very substantial reduction in resources four or five years ago. It takes four years to train an electrician or a joiner or uh, a, a plumber. We are in the process of increasing the number of apprentices, increasing the number of trainees, increasing our capacity to invest and deliver. Some idea, if we are faced in four years, five years' time with another sharp reduction in investment, much of that capacity will be lost again, and much of that uh, uh, energy will be wasted. And many of those people drawn back into the sector, particularly trainees, particularly apprentices, will find themselves without a job again. So the longer term, matching some of the financial planning horizons against the actual asset and organisational planning horizons is an issue for us. Okay, uh, yes, Nicola Barclay. Finally, I'm not sure if I'm the last one to speak at this particular bit. just want to reinforce what Professor Gibb was saying about the benefits of all tenures of homes. Obviously, the session here today is very much focused on the affordable delivery, but we can't forget the impact that the private sector has on that um, through their Section 75 obligations and how they work in partnership with the affordable sector, unlocking sites which suit, um, which provide accommodation for all. It would be a full house if Mr Stewart wished to comment. I don't know if you want to add oh, anything. Just, um, I would just say that I'm concerned that if there's too much of a rush, things might be done, not be done to the quality that's required. I mean, just speaking from a Gorbals perspective, we've just demolished 65% of the housing stock that was built in the 60s and 70s in the Gorbals, and I've got a real concern that the um, quality and the thought that goes into the planning and the means of procurement and so forth um, may not deliver um, sustainable housing and sustainable communities. And that's got to be a real concern. The capacity, which has been hugely diminished by some previous government initiatives, um, is possibly not there to deliver this as quickly as everybody would like. And I don't think people should panic in that context. I think you should spread it over a further period of time if that is necessary. An additional year to do the right thing would be uh, the right way to invest public money. OK. I might just follow up on some of that and then I'll bring some, some of the other members in. Uh, it was quite interesting hearing from Nicola Barclay in relation to its affordable housing, but the, the private sector has a role as well. As all MSPs do, we start to look at our own constituencies. So in Hamilton Hill, in the Mary Hill and Springburn constituency, we've got a proposed development partnership development with Scottish Canals, Glasgow City Council and various other providers. 200 uh, social rented houses, 200 private houses. Unclear who the private delivery agent will be, but they're starting to talk together about what that housing mix might look like. Elsewhere in my constituency, there's large swathes of land 
that we, we're really quite desperate to, to see developed for the correct type <coughs> of housing development. So yes, social rented, but also we're keen to get a mix there. So I, I suppose my, my question is, is the social rented sector and the private sector, are there deep and meaningful links and conversations that take place? Because there must be significant opportunities. Because in Postle Park, for example, when I met a, a local housing association, the chief exec said, you know, I would always have said what we want is more social rented housing here, but we actually want private housing as well because we need a mixed community. So are those conversations taking place with local authorities, housing associations and the private sector? Uh, Nicola Barclay. Yeah, they certainly are. Um, our membership is, majority is private sector, but we do have RSLs as members as well. And a lot of our members have built up really good relationships with local housing associations across the years. And whenever they acquire a site and they have Section 75 obligations, they know which RSL they're going to speak to. They've spoken even before they put the bid in to buy the land, so that they know it's going to be a mixed tenure de development from the very beginning. I think we have learnt lessons of the past where we've had swathes and swathes of, of maybe either RSL stock, um, social rented stock on its own, or private stock on its own, and there's lack of community facilities for either. And so I think, um, as, as a former planner, we've recognised as a profession that you have to actually plan for new communities, you can't just assume it'll happen. So you have to make sure you've got the mix of tenure in there so people can stay within a particular area as they move up through their own housing journey. They may start out in a social rented unit. They may then be able to move to mid-market rent or may, with the benefit of something like help to buy, move on to that housing ladder. But they don't want to necessarily move out of that area where they've grown up, where their friends and family are. So it's really crucial that we all work together, and mm -hmm. which is why we all sit on the joint housing policy and delivery group, recognising this has got to be a joint approach. Mary Taylor, do you want to add anything to that? I mean, I think I'm glad Nicola raised the point about the joint delivery group, because that, that's at the national level, um, and I think that that's where those conversations definitely take place, and there are good conversations taking place. But um, it also has to happen at the local scale. Um, and and I think that we're... Well, I mean, we're, at the moment, we're, wait, we're all waiting for... Um, and, and at the local scale, some people are actively engaging in a process around uh, producing what's called the SHIP, uh, the Strategic Housing Investment Programme, um, which should, should set out, every local authority should be setting out what uh, not only the needs but also the opportunities are for all kinds of housing, tenure, uh, uh, you know, without regard to tenure. Um, so in other words, covering all of them um, so that they know where the investment can take place and will ultimately will take place in the local planning agreements, which will be signed up in, in, in the aftermath of that. Um, but, but I mean, I think my concern, if I, if I have a concern here, it is that we are aiming to hit the 35, and I think we probably need to overshoot the 35, because not all sites can be developed at the same speed. And, and Fraser's absolutely right to say that there is a danger of rushing at some things, unless we get the parameters right at the start. Um, we, we, uh, there's a real danger of building in mistakes. So I think we need to be working closely at the local scale, involving all the potential parties to see who can contribute what to meeting need. And, um, and then that, that, will, that, that should produce an, a potential oversupply. Um, but, but attrition, I think, will mean that some of those actually fall by the wayside anyway. Okay, any additional comments in relation to that, Mr Keane? Did you want to come in? I mean, I would observe that the, the strategic planning framework for housing at a local level has been developed specifically to encourage and, and strengthen local working between the public sector and the private sector. So if you look at the processes around the housing needs and demand assessments, which has to involve a, a wider range of partners through local housing market partnerships uh, and the process of developing local housing strategies, it all requires the local authority to engage with a wider range of partners, including the private sector. And Nicola and I both served on a local housing market partnership uh, in my own area uh, a number of years ago. So I think that has improved and our familiarity is getting better. And you see some of the benefits of that in a, a number of quite explicit investment decisions, which are putting invested in rented housing, whether it's mid-market or social rented, as a lead investment into, into larger private sector schemes, which allows the developer the confidence to go in, to put in the infrastructure, to, to open a site and to start to build and give them the space to test the market and develop a product. So I think that joint working is there, it's improving. There's always scope for, scope for improvement, but it is better certainly than it was 10 or 15 years ago. No, oh, uh, sorry, Fraser Stewart. I think I'd like to make a contribution just simply in the context that the garbage is probably the 
the biggest and it's recognised as probably the most successful urban regeneration project in the UK since 1992. And at the very heart of that has been the Community Controlled Housing Association and that's been a key characteristic of its success and, and that's undeniable and that's accepted by all of the people that come to visit there. Everything has got to be done in the context of, of collaboration and an agreed framework, and typically that would be led by the local authority. A huge concern of mine is that if it's left to the private sector, and this is no fault of the private sector, that the partnerships which may well be developed are the, with well-kent faces, as opposed to the most, in my opinion, or other people's opinion, the most appropriate developer, which in virtually every single case we would argue is a, a community-controlled developer. They don't always exist, so that's not always possible. So there are cases in Glasgow where um, community Community-controlled developers have been marginalised, therefore their expertise, the kind of expertise that we've brought to a process for the last 25 years, which has led to huge success, will be lost. Uh, and I, I just think that if it's about community empowerment, about recognising the quality that communities can bring to things, you just have to look at the gobbles. Um, I think that's a key point. Yeah, and a couple, you know, it's about a couple of members to come in on that, and that, that was going to be my final point, and then I'm going to take... Um, Graham, and on that, my final point would be the people that matter, of course, are the communities that, that are there, that, that are in housing need. I do have concerns, Mr Stewart, if you're saying there's a disconnect between some of the strategic planning that's going on and local community-controlled housing associations, that would worry me deeply. Uh, I, I'm just wondering what discussions take place at a local authority level, not just with, say, large housing associations and developers, but actually with local communities as to type of, the type of housing need and aspirations they have to build communities rather than just, I mean, I, mean, I can only speak in my constituency that the first time a community knows about new housing development is when they see the sign go up and the engineering work start. And then I get calls to my office saying, is that social housing? Can I get a house? So there's clearly a disconnect with the local community with some of these developments. I'm worried if there's a disconnect between com with community-controlled housing associations as well. So um, how, how, how do we fix that? What, what's going wrong? Well, I guess it could start with nationally agreed protocols with regard to how community engagement ought to be undertaken in areas of major and indeed also minor regeneration and the prospect of uh, the inclusion of uh, appropriate community-controlled organisations should, should be taken on board. That, do that doesn't happen as part of the process. Sometimes it happens by accident, sometimes it, it, it happens deliberately, and certainly, and Mary Hill, it's happened deliberately through a strategic framework created by the Council, uh, but it hasn't happened in other areas. I wouldn't indulge in Mary Hill because that, that's my area. Other members do want to get in before I take Graham Simpson and Mary Taylor and then we'll move on to the next question. Well, I, I think I want to just clarify how the system ought to be working. Um, and we haven't seen the ships yet, so we don't actually know. We won't see them before the end of this month. So it's kind of early to be judging um, whether people have had the opportunity yet. Um, but what ought to be happening at, uh, across the country is that people should be having discussions about what scheme, what land they have, what schemes... They have an appetite to develop uh, on what terms uh, so that those can be put into the mix and I know that I know from a number of conversations with people in local authorities across the country that that sort of thing is going on um, and I and I think it has to go on because it needs to be open to everybody to make that contribution in order to meet the target um, but I think that the later stage around involving communities is once schemes are actually in the programme, in the agreed programme, and then communities have every opportunity through the normal planning channels and through engagement with community councils and all of the rest of it to know what's being proposed for their areas. And, um, I, and I think that, that so it shouldn't, it shouldn't be left to the point where if communities aren't engaging with the process, that's different. But there are processes there that allow communities to engage. Okay, yeah, I mean, in my experience, I would say in Julie Fitzpatrick, in my experience, sometimes communities are looking for co-production. So when the initial plans emerge, they don't want to be consulted in phase two plan and phase three plan. They want to be sitting down with the planners and saying, let's shape this community together. And certainly in my constituency, that, that doesn't always happen. But let's not prejudge what's about to come out, Julie Fitzpatrick. Just two points, really. Um, one horizons based in in West Lothian and 
I suppose just to take a very practical example, we are involved in a couple of developments just now in two quite small villages, and one is with a local development trust, so it's very much community-led um, and partnership-based. Um, so I think there are some models perhaps emerging, and that's related to the rural housing grant um, model and very much a kind of co-production. Uh, the other one is in is in um, Stonyburn in West Lothian, where again the community council were probably the people who initiated the discussion, and then the local authority responded to that. Now that's taken a very long time to deliver, for all the reasons that um, Tony referred to in terms of what's happened over the last four or five years. But I think there are there are models there, and there's some good practice there. Uh, and in terms of the ships, that certainly both at a local level and various other um, local authority involvements, we are generally invited to discussions about the content of the ships. So I think there, there's some good stuff going on. The other thing I just wanted to talk about is in relation to your um, the point about co-production is that when we talk about communities, we are also talking about communities of interest. And I think what we do see is a lack in quite a lot of the strate strategic plans of, the, of involvement and real co-production of disabled people in coming up with those. Um, and so that's where there's perhaps room for improvement. Okay, thank you. Now we're going to move on now. Graham Simpson followed by Eileen Smith. Thanks, convener. Um, I, I, I just want to pick up on this uh, point first raised by uh, Mr. Bookbinder. Um, about uh, you're basically talking about the the smaller housing associations being squeezed out of the market. Um, that's certainly been mentioned to me by some of the smaller associations in my area. Um, I mentioned it in a speech in the chamber, but the, unfortunately the housing minister didn't didn't bite. Um, perhaps we'll get a chance to quiz him on it. Um, I just wonder. I guess it's a question for all of you because you're all involved. Uh, in, in the sector, how how do we sort that out? How do we get more variety um, yeah, of, of, of people involved? Um, how do we spread the load? How do we take it away from the big boys and pass it down to uh, the smaller associations? Anyone want to comment on, on that, David Bookbinder? As, uh, uh, it, it, goes, it goes back to my point. I'll be brief. I mean, I... I it is early days at the, at the moment. Uh, as I said, some of the impressions we, we have got is of associations who've asked to be at the table and haven't necessarily found themselves with uh, with, with, with schemes, uh, it, it, you know, in the, in the current ship, and that we, we suspect that will be confirmed by some of the ships that we see uh, in, in the next couple of weeks. Um, <laughs> In a way, uh, it, it, it will be true in some areas that some of the smaller associations, uh, you know, Tony mentioned the ramping up that, that, that's needed and that takes time. And that will be the case for some associations. I suppose what we're talking about is those associations that have said we're ready and we can, you know, despite the problems of, the, of previous years, we are ready to make a contribution. Hopefully, this, I mean, the forum would say this, this doesn't need to become any kind of us and them in terms of in terms of other providers this is a huge program and there should be room for everyone and it seems that you know th th there's maybe a missed a missed opportunity our members by and large uh, will we, we'll, we'll probably be proposing smaller schemes uh, that, that, that complete or hopefully uh, contribute to completing the, the, the sites they've had their eyes on for a few years in their area that does take more program managing to deal with a larger number of of, of smaller projects, but it is that essential community input uh, uh, to go along with other other, other parts of, of, of the programme. It does take more management, and one's, maybe our first impression is if, if council may, may find it easier to deal with you know, a larger provider doing a larger project than five providers doing smaller projects. But it's, it's early days. Anyone else want to comment in relation to that? Fraser Stewart yeah, and then Tony um, Keane. I think... If you want more empowerment and co-production and indeed ownership from, from smaller groups, that's got to become part and parcel of um, local authority and Scottish government policy and protocols uh, to give that priority because otherwise smaller players will not actually be able to compete with the bigger players. They have to actually be given a very definite priority because of the added value they bring 
That currently doesn't happen. It didn't have to happen 15 years ago because there weren't any big players. Now you've got an absolutely huge Scottish group and a huge number of large English-based RSLs looking for development opportunities. And in that context, the smaller players need, I would argue, statutory protection uh, and, and the, the bar set higher for them to encourage, to encourage them to, to, to up their game. I, I, I think I would simply observe that the, it, local authorities have, the res, have a responsibility to have an eye on the provider framework locally and make strategic decisions about by whom and where investments take place. That should be done transparently, it should be done openly in collaboration. But there are 60, 62 housing associations in Glasgow, 90 or so developing associations across Scotland. It's pretty unlikely that they're all going to get a slice of the pie. And not necessarily helpful if we start from everybody's got to get something if our objective is the most efficient and effective, uh, cost-effective way of uh, delivering the houses we've got to deliver. So I think I'm not, it's not for me to defend individual local authorities. I would expect decision making to be open, transparent, explicit and based on the set of strategic objectives around the provider framework. But that's likely to mean some organisations don't get what they want. If that's what's going on, that'll be unfortunate for them as associations. But I think that's something they should be raising with the local authority. OK, thank you. Mary Taylor and then Nicola Barclay. I, I would just like to echo what, what David said. This is not about us and them. And the SFHA represents all types of association of all scales right across the country. And I made the point earlier that everybody needs to be making a contribution to meeting need. For some, that will be on a very small scale. For some, it will be on a very large scale. Um, it, I think it, I'm right in saying um, that about 40 associations until recently have actually been actively developing out of the hun nearly 160 that there are across the country. And that is as a, that's fewer than it was five years ago as a consequence of the cuts. So that's where the gearing up needs to take place. Now, some people are taking time to do that. Um, it has all the same issues of training people up that Tony referred to earlier about electricians, um, because you need intelligent clients to be commissioning at the start of the process. And that takes time for people to gear up. And there are all sorts of other issues that various of us have commented on. Uh, around the risk assessment that associations are having to make about whether to develop, on what scale to develop, on what terms to develop, over what period, and with what partners. And all of those discussions are actively happening right across the country so that people are making their own judgments about how far to develop on what scale and, and to just echo things that Julia was saying, uh, uh, not just about the generality of needs, but also about some of the very particular needs, particularly around the health and wellbeing agenda, to be able to support um, more supported housing, which is actively being undermined by some of the changes that are coming down the line from Westminster around the local housing allowance in relation to local um, uh, supported accommodation. Okay. Nicola Barclay. I just wanted to um, use the analogy of what's happened in the, the private house building industry and the um, reduction in SMEs in the sector. And, and those who are still there are not being supported by the planning system. I think given the scale of the challenge of, of solving this housing crisis, we are seeing huge sites being allocated, um, which will be controlled by one or two big players. And you're not having the opportunity for the smaller local builders to come in and do smaller sites. And I, I would assume it's very similar for the RSL side. We need to make sure we've got a balanced land allocation that suits a number of different types of provider. Helpful, thank you. Professor Gibb? I'm just going to say that, uh, just to kind of reinforce what David and Ma Mary said, that uh, I said in my written evidence that it, it seems to me that for a long period of time that some associations have made a, a rational and active choice not, not to develop. And 40 out of 160, I'm sure it is the case that there are some which are kind of want to be at the table and are not at the table. And where they're already community anchors, that's very unfortunate. But I think I should also say and sort of declare an interest in this that I'm, I'm the chair of one of the uh, housing associations who are a Scottish subsidiary of a UK na national body. And I just wanted to make the point really that uh, it's not just that it's not the, 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 them and us in that sense. And that, the co-production question also relates to housing associations themselves. We've been involved in joint ventures and, and working in partnership with community controlled associations, and we hope to do more of that in the future. And we think there are mutual be benefits uh, to, to, to both groups. Okay, thank you. Graham Simpson, do you want to add anything to that? Um, no, I'm keen to hear the other members of the committee. Okay, Elaine Smith, to follow by Ruth McGuire. Thank you. Thanks very much, convener. Um, I 
I did have a specific question for Mary Taylor from the evidence that was provided, but could I just pick up on something that, that you said, first of all, in your answer there? And it was, um, you talked about the, 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 the changes that were coming with regard to local housing allowance. So could I explore that a bit further with you, particularly given the intimations from the, the, the Scottish Government that they might be holding off and taking control of the, the Social Security until 2020? Could you maybe expand a bit further on what... Um, implications you think that that might have on budgets and particularly for supported accommodation? Um, well, I would draw a distinction between the powers that are likely to come, to, that, that will come under the Scotland Act to the Scottish Government, because those are around, around universal credit flexibilities um, and the powers to top up other benefits and to continue to mitigate and, and so on. So at the moment, you, what you're committing to as a parliament is bedroom tax mitigation in full, um, but there are other uh, implications of other welfare benefit cuts from Westminster which may also need mitigation in future on top of the bedroom tax. Um, the universal credit flexibilities, I think we have been working hard uh, as the national body to ensure that there is a, 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 a robust commitment to protect landlord income in all of this, so that if a tenant is eligible for um, support through the welfare benefits system, that that support for housing costs can be paid direct to the landlord rather than going to the tenant, because that's affecting our cash collection rates on the basis of what we're monitoring at the moment. And I'm not going to mention figures because they're really quite quite alarming, but if they were to be replicated on the scale, that would, that would be seriously damaging to the sector. Um, so local people who know that are fi factoring that into their risk assessment around universal credit. On top of that, we have the local housing allowance situation, which was announced this time last year, which is not affected by the Scotland Act or the additional powers. And what that's doing is already fact affecting new tenants aged under 35, because the, the LHA rates that they're eligible for, which is appended to the back of Tony's uh, paper from Alacho, um, are already higher than most social rents. So already there are gaps emerging of between five and 15 pounds a week for people aged under 35. Um, most social rents are actually under the LHA as things stand at the moment, but there are one or two that aren't. The big issue down the line uh, is, the, is the area of supported accommodation. And we hope to have further dialogue with the Scottish Parliament on this in the near future. We're um, waiting at the moment for the DWP to publish research that they undertook uh, in Wales and England and Scotland on the costs of supported accommodation, which have a direct bearing on um, projects of supported accommodation for disabled people, um, physical disability, um, learning disability, people with mental health problems, older people and so on, because this, isn't, this is no longer about people of working age, this is right across the population. But uh, until we see that research and until we see the exact detail of the proposals which are due to come in in three years' time, well, it's less than three years now, but um, it, it's difficult to judge. So, but as I say, all of those things, if you, if you work in an, air, in an association which provides predominantly supported accommodation and you think there is a risk that all of your tenants, not just the new tenants, might have their housing and support costs capped, um, to the level of the LHA, which is born of private sector rents, which have got nothing to do with social housing funding or rent levels, then you might reasonably think, is it safe for us to develop um, this, that or the other project if we don't know that we've actually got a rental, rental income security, as Tony said, for 30 years down the line? And I did actually ask a question. Can I just, Mr. Bookbinder wanted to come in and, sure. and, and, and add just to that, to and, and just that, that was a helpful way to take us through, because obviously the Social Security Committee in this place will look at some of that, but how it directly impacts on investment for affordable housing would be of direct interest to this committee. Apologies, Elaine, sorry, Mr. Bookbinder. It was just to, to complement what, what Mary said, just we gave an example in our, in our evidence. If you imagine a, a, new, a new build scheme coming off site in April 2018 or, or, or any time in the three years after that, uh, it's quite possible that 50 or 60% of the lets might go to people under 35, some of them coming out of homelessness, some from the waiting list, etc. A proportion of them, a good proportion of them, may well be in receipt of benefit. Supposing the rent is, eight, I don't know, 80, 82 pounds a week, whatever, um, in April in April of 2018, 68 quid is as much as they'll get. 
from the benefit system because of the LHA cap. That's a huge shortfall for, for, for maybe half the lets in that new build scheme. So just to give a graphic example, if you like. Uh, Julie Fitzpatrick. Just wanted to, to, to supplement a little bit what was said there. Um, absolutely agree with, with, with Mary and David. And the, the point about supported accommodation is that already the Westminster government is talking about ways in which people who live in supported accommodation might be exempt and so on. Um, but absolutely that is going to constrain investment in what may be a really necessary resource, again, to align with health and social care um, integration and, and outcomes from that. But the other point is really not about supported accommodation, but Horizon um, specialises in integrated, inclusive communities where we provide housing for disabled people just as ordinary housing. So the people who live in there, the, the rent levels are often higher because of the degree of adaptation of those properties, but they're not in a category. Uh, and certainly our calculations at, at this stage are that there are probably, um, in some cases, shortfalls of £40, 40 pounds a week for some of them. Um, there's an, a link to the investment because without some sort of capital support to keep the, the build to support the build costs for this type of housing. The only way then of supporting it is higher rents. Uh, and that's that's where we get into a bit of a double whammy really for these people. Um, the other um, sort of double whammy is that universal credit has specifically excluded from eligibility any costs for a tenant related to adaptations. Um, so there's a number of different things coming together. I mean, I wouldn't disagree with anything that's been said so far. What, what, what I would add, though, and you, you would have seen in our evidence, we have focused primarily on the impact around the homelessness service on a, on a number of fronts, and I think that is our major concern. I think we'll deliver the 50,000 houses. I have a bigger concern of what happens to homeless folk over the next five years. And looking at the LHA cap, 11 of the 26 stockholding authorities are already charging more for a one-bedroom flat than the shared accommodation rate in their local area. There are another five who are within... Uh, a, a distance of that who are likely to get captured uh, within that group within the period of the freeze of the LHA up to 2050. So we're in a place, 2020, we're in a place already where that offer, if you offer a, a single homeless person who's on benefit, a property which their benefit won't cover, that would not be regarded as a reasonable offer. It's not an appropriate outcome and you wouldn't be able to make that offer. Local authorities are already talking about restructuring rents in order to bring their rents down below the LHA cap to allow them to continue to meet their need. We obviously have a concern. Now, housing associations across the piece offer about 23 24% of their lets to homeless folks, so already significantly lower than, than that in the local authority sector. But even that relatively low level of accommodation of homeless folk across the sector is severely threatened by the impact of the LHA cap, particularly on young, younger single homeless folk. To clarify, this will impact on the ability of social landlords to seek HAG funding to build because the, the business model around that and the, the revenue insecurity from rents, because we're doing the budget scrutiny here, we're, 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 we're concerned about that, if that is the case. It, it, will, play out, first of it all. will play out in a number of different areas. If, if, if a landlord can't be certain to get the rent in at a particular level and that level is required to fund the scheme, then either they'll be looking for more money or they'll, they'll, they'll not go if capital grant to support the scheme or they'll, to support lower rents or they'll not go ahead with the development. So it will in the medium term unquestionably impact on, on the development programme, as does the current uncertainty around uh, rent and, and uh, support funding in the uh, supported sector because although it appears there may be arrangements to assist with the funding of existing projects, how you plan for funding for new projects is now extremely problematic. So there is a real difficulty for providers in thinking we want to provide this new 15, 20 units here in three years' time because there's no certainty anymore about how the, how the core result, how the core revenue stream, the, the, the rental stream, is going, to, is going to be available. Uh, Mary Taylor, and then we'll let Elaine back in to, 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 to move supplementary in some of that. Mary? Mm -hmm. um, let's suppose, I mean, maybe a worked example is, is quite useful. So if, if, um, if it costs £150,000 uh, to build a house to the standards that are required today, including land and fees and all the rest of it, and VAT, and 70,000 of that is being funded by grant, then the other 80,000 
um, for the sake of argument, has to be funded from private borrowing by a housing association. It will be public borrowing by a local authority. But in order to commit to that borrowing, whichever, whichever type of landlord, whichever type of funding, you have to have confidence in your ability to repay that over time. And that's where when 60% of our rental income is, is derived originally from housing benefit because the tenants that we're letting to, um, even with the modest rents that are charged for, for social housing, still need support to pay those rents. Then, our, then any change that, that uh, disturbs, if you like, the security of that rental income long term is going to be a matter of great concern. And, and any responsible <coughs> landlord looking to develop new housing will be having to factor those kinds of things into the equation in taking decisions about whether and, and to what extent to develop. Okay, um, I'm going to bring our vice convener back in, Elaine Smith, to follow up on that. And then seamlessly, you're going to see Elaine take over the chair because I've got another <laughs> meeting that I have to go to. Uh, the First Minister's appearing at the conveners group um, in, in a short while, and I have to go and prepare for that. So, Elaine, do you want to follow up on some of that? Thank you very much, convener. Um, yeah, uh, just to say that I think it is an issue. I did raise it in the chamber a couple of weeks ago via a question. So, it's obviously something I think we need to explore a lot further. But the specific question before I take over this chair was for Mary Taylor and it was on the evidence and it was about um, the, the separate fund for special needs house and the subsidy working group recommended that but it was not accepted. I just wanted to ask specifically if you know why it was not accepted. Maybe you can give us a bit more information. I was on the I was on that working group and no good reason Sorry, was given. Was that a question to me? Well yeah. only me only because it was in I picked it up from the SFHA Sorry. submission. So um, perhaps maybe to yourself yeah. first and then to Fraser yeah, sure. Stewart. Okay, thank you. Um, our, our understanding, uh, at, at the time, um, Alec Neil was the Cabinet Secretary responsible um, and the subsidy review group, um, which Fraser was on for on behalf of the forum and the SFHA was on, um, not through me personally, um, had recommended that uh, if the objectives of mo having more people living at home or in homely settings and living independently in those settings was to be achieved then there needed to be more of a, a strand of investment protected for that area. I have no idea frankly why that um, what recommendation wasn't accepted because all of the other recommendations I think bar one on environmental funds were, um, were accepted and implemented with immediate effect and certainly had absolutely the desired effect of getting people to look again at development because the risk profile had changed. It's Mr Stewart, sorry. Um, it's Mr. Stewart. There was no good reason given for um, that not flowing through the system and it, it does have a huge impact, particularly in organisations like Horizon where a disproportionate amount of funding is going to special needs because the, the thinking is that the, the overall development will subsidise the special needs aspects of it. So if the majority of what you're doing uh, is, is um, for example, um, wheelchair accessible housing, then you haven't got a chance. But beyond that, in Glasgow, I think our target is 10% um, of housing to be to wheelchair standards. That is not achievable by our organisation because the on costs of that kind of housing are phenomenal. So for them not to be taken account of in the, at the capital end of things, the, the grant side of things, is, is just plain wrong and that should be addressed if there's enough money to do that. But unfortunately, I don't think there's anything that the capital side of things can, can do about the other um, dysfunctional nature of the uh, benefit system. We, we can't put you know, Scottish Government's money into subsidising things that are plainly wrong on the revenue side. It's got to be, it's got to be dealt with by revenue contribution, if at all. Does that, I mean, how, how does that fit with the bedroom tax mitigation? Well, the bedroom tax mitigation, for example, worked really well in Scotland, so that was that 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 that, that, that was perfect. So that was done on a revenue basis, but nobody was seeking to. I mean, the grant system. I think local authorities moving to bring down certain costs below the LHA uh, to protect under thirty-five year olds is is potentially politically the wrong thing to do. I completely sympathise with the, with why you would want to do it and to find ways of, of making sure. But I think a far more sensible way would be for uh, Scottish Government, to, if able, to consider giving direct revenue subsidy. Because if you do that at the provider end, you're just going to let rents be set by Westminster policy. And who knows where that would end? It would be a very dangerous precedent to set. Julie Fitzpatrick. Just, just really wanted to. I, I wasn't involved in in any of the subsidy working groups, um, so so can't say why that was that that 
there wasn't a, a decision made for a subsidy. But I, I could guess that one possible reason was that it might have been quite difficult to actually work out how much. So I just wanted to offer um, that I think we're probably talking about two different types of additional um, grant that are required in order to support um, building of the types of homes we need. One um, is at the kind of more specialist end and perhaps the, the approach which is the kind of flexible approach looking at one on a case-by-case -case basis is more appropriate there which I think is what the, the working group had, had kind of come up with but the other is really about just how do we make sure that this portfolio of new housing is going to include enough housing that is going to be easily adaptable to um, housing for wheelchair users and for a range of other needs. Um, it, it's not kind of widely known that you, you need a house as, as, as big as a wheel, for a wheelchair user, for someone who uses a Zimmer, for example. Um, we have done, Horizon has done work with um, our parent um, company, Link, around looking at how much do you, does it actually cost for that additional floor area, those wider doors, um, and some of that kind of additional space that you need? So we certainly would be able to, and, and be delighted to work with the government on coming up with a specific figure which would encourage and support the housing industry to deliver better results, perhaps, than it has managed to do over the last few years. OK, thank you very much. Um, I'm just about to take over the chair now as the convener's left, but I'm going to call Ruth McGuire to ask a question while okay. I move. Thank you, convener. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm in, I'd like to talk a bit about um, the subsidy levels, and I was um, interested in Professor Gibbs' um, submission where um, you spoke about the parity between... Um, social landlord and local authority subsidy um, benchmarks. And you stated in your um, evidence that you thought it was right, but maybe the proportions were wrong. I just, could you expand on, on that a bit? I should, I should start by saying that I wasn't on the subsidy working group. <laughs> and uh, I think there's other people here who know a lot better about this than, than I do. My, uh, and Tony and I were talking about this before we started, um, my kind of position is just in principle, it seems to me that uh, you might imagine that in general, because local authorities can borrow uh, longer term and uh, from, from the public sector, that they should be able to get a better deal on average than housing associations. That That is a case, perhaps, Tony may have a different view about this, that, that may be a case for suggesting that local authorities could survive with a slightly lower grant on that, on that basis, other things being equal. But that, to me, doesn't say anything about what the, the ratio or the, the right, correct disparity ought to be. There are clearly implications of that, because that changes the size of the pot available to, to both groups. And uh, that, that obviously has an impact on what, what councils could, could do. So I think that's the implication of that, that, that follows, follows from that. As I say, I, I couldn't possibly begin to say what the right ratio is, but I'd be interested to know maybe from some of my colleagues here what some of the thinking was about that too. Thank you. Since Tony Keane was mentioned, perhaps we'll ask him to comment. Yeah, I, 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 it's a common misconception that local authorities or local authority housing services can borrow at rates which are lower than those available to housing associations. HRA's housing revenue accounts are charged the pool rate, the internally calculated average for all the councils borrowing, and currently they range from just under 4% to about 5.75. So there are landlords, local authority landlords paying nearly 6% even now uh, on their borrowing. So we're not getting any cheaper. Uh, my concern about the differential, and, uh, and again, this is not an area where we have majored in our evidence because I'm far more concerned about what is happening in the homelessness services and mental health services uh, across Scotland. But our concern about the differential is simply this. It means that council tenants pay a higher proportion of the cost of every new house that is built in the social rented sector than RSL tenants. And my question is very simple. Why is that fair? They're not any better off. They're not any less likely to be dependent on housing benefit. They're not any, they're not any better equipped to, to pay that higher proportion. But council tenants, through their rents, pay a higher proportion of the construction costs of new social rented houses than their counterparts, often in the same street in the RSL sector. And my question, when the issue is raised again, will be, help me out to understand why that is fair. I don't believe it is. Thank you. Well, it's handy to get questions on the record, but at the moment I think it's the members that are asking them. Can I come back to Ruth <laughs> McGuire? Yes. I'd, I'd be interested in the answer to that question as well. Um, I suppose I'm kind of going back a little bit now, um, thinking about um, housing for older people or adapted housing. Um, and we've, we've heard that we need mixed tenure communities, so I suppose it's just what can we do to um, help um, the private sector um, 
you know, build these types of houses as well, or what, what can be done to make sure within these mixed tenure communities that that, that kind of um, spread is there? Tony Kane, you were nodding. Well, my apologies. Yeah. I, I, on the issue of accessible and, and, and wheelchair accessible housing in particular, I think the sector as a whole generally plans around identified needs and for the most part, I think, is doing a reasonable job. M the vast majority of people over the age of, uh, of 60 in this country, something like 80% of everybody over age of 60, and I'm older people here in particular, are owner occupiers. The question should be, how do we get more wheelchair accessible and highly adaptable housing into the unoccupied sector, not how do we, uh, how do we get more into, into the private into the, so, the social rented sector? Because that's where the issues around accessibility, particularly for older people, are going to start arising in a big, big way in the next 10 years. Claire Barclay, would you want to come in on them? Nodding away there. <laughs> um, I think we have a, a huge amount of um, selling to do to older people who are in their own homes to persuade them to downsize. And I don't think, as, a, as an industry, we provide much of a product at the moment. There's one or two main players who do housing for older people, um, who you will know. I don't need to advertise them. Um, there are far more um, in England that, that are providing older people's housing, um, but we only have one player in Scotland. And something that I have raised with our members, and there seems little appetite at the moment. But I know there was um, one of the SNP manifesto commitments was to look at some kind of help to buy model for older people and um, we've yet to see any detail of what that's going to be like and we'll be very happy to work with government to try to shape that um, as they bring it forward. I don't think it'll be a help to buy as in a mortgage product, it'll be some kind of way of incentivising people to move out of that large, maybe historically family home and, and to move into accommodation. I think once you've got a, a financial incentive and a product there then our members, the house builders, will start looking at providing suitable accommodation if they if they see a market opportunity. Thank you. Ruth, do you want to explain anything further there? No, that's fine. Thank um, you. I have Kenneth Gibson next yes, on the thanks list. Very much. Just on that last point, when I was a councillor in Glasgow way back in the 1990s, when people actually had large... Uh, houses, um, you know, um, they were in order to, and there was a big shortage of those family houses, they used to actually offer the, the tenants um, small houses in better parts of the city, in actual fact, to try and free up those large, larger houses. And I thought, though, that if you're an owner-occupier and you're selling a four-bedroom, you're down to a two-bedroom, the incentive is you'll make quite a bit of money. Probably if your mortgage is paid off, I'm not I'm, I'm not really sure about, uh, how much support the taxpayer should give. But my, my question, actually, uh, I was going to ask the same similar question to yourself, Convener, in terms of you know, the Westminster Cuts to Housing Benefit, universal credit for social housing tenants posing a significant threat to the success of new build programme. But I think that was adequately answered by the, the panel. So I'd like to ask Nicola Barclay something about um, her submission. Um, she says that, um, and I quote, despite slippage in programmes and projects having RSL support, builders have encountered local authority unwillingness to add shovel-ready affordable housing projects to SHIP's programmes. This is hampering the delivery of affordable homes as it means Scottish Government subsidy cannot be secured. I'm just wondering if you can uh, tell us some of the, the difficulties that were actually uh, that are actually being encountered here and uh, how those can be countered. Club back, please. Yes. No. This is um, in response to when we asked members for feedback on these questions. Um, members who have noticed the opportunity of the 50,000 affordable home requirement from government and have moved into that sector, but, haven't, but aren't RSLs, they're private developers and are trying to get, um, uh, you know, build partnerships with local authority to get their, their sites um, into the affordable housing programme, but because they're not in the ship already, they've been restricted from doing so. Okay, so it's, it's the lack of flexibility. Okay, so you can tell us what, why this is happening, or what, um, what, what the, the um, you know, what's the motivation behind this from a local authority perspective in, in the view of your members? I can't answer on behalf of the local authority, I, whether it's the fact that they already have their, their ship in place or, or did have at the time and didn't want to change what was in it, whether they felt that uh, a new site coming in would make something else drop out the bottom. I, I'm not close enough to the individual uh, example to give you any greater detail. I can hear Mary saying something beside me, you might be able to... Offer some light Ella, on do you that. wish to add to yeah, this? I, I, I think you offered. I think Nicola offered the a, a possible explanation. I've I've not heard of examples of this, yeah. and I'd want to know more before commenting in yeah. detail. Any other um, panel member wish to contribute? It's, it's likely to be about strategic fit. It's as simple yeah. as that. And the, the programmes are, are relatively long term, three or four years, uh, and propping up towards the end of a programme and saying, "I've got this. How about it?" isn't necessarily always helpful. Mm -hmm. 
Nicola Barclay. This is maybe um, a developer who's moving into this market area but hasn't had the history and to understand the relationships that are already in place and the processes that are in place. Um, and when is the right time to put your site forward to go into a ship? So it may be that. I'd, I'd be happy to go away and find out more if you're interested, Mr Gibson. Thank you. Ken Gibson. Thank you very much. And just as just a wee follow-up, actually, again, on Nicholas' paper. I mean, you say here in your paper that, uh, you know, we should continue to look at ways that efficiencies in delivery can be increased. And I'm sure everyone would agree with that. But you also say at the moment there's a different design brief and expectation of finished product for every new affordable scheme, RL, RSL or council. And this could be argued does not result in the best... Uh, use of money. I mean, I suppose the counter on that is that we'll end up however, all the houses being in the same boxes across the country. Um, are you, you arguing, therefore, for some kind of hub approach, effectively? Um, it's directed to you, please. Thank you. I think we need to look at standardising house types. You can do that without them all looking identical from the outside. Um, there's, you know, the real uh, lack of efficiency when you have eight different RSLs with eight different versions or eight different variations of design, which should be fairly standard design in the first place. So I think there are efficiencies to be made. Um, I don't think we should be looking for identical houses all across the country. We want to always res you know, reflect some of the, the local vernacular. But you can, you can certainly make efficiencies in, in design, especially if we're going to be looking towards uh, modular construction to increase the supply. Um, that will help that... Um, more kind of manufactured style process of, of housing delivery and will speed up the process as well. Mary Taylor, you indicated? Well, I'd, I'd like to echo the, uh, the point about the move towards modular construction off-site prefabrication. They're, they all, uh, they're pretty interchangeable terms, I think. Um, and we do need to modernise the way in which we approach construction, but that does require long-term planning and long-term commitments mm -hmm for the capital investment to be made by the usually private sector developers who produce this kind of housing. Um, and I know from discussions that we have had with some of those together um, uh, of their nervousness around expanding their capacity unless they have confidence in the long-term supply. I don't agree that, uh, that the way that we're doing things at the moment is inherently inefficient, which is what you were implying. Um, and I'm not convinced from what I know of the costs of modular and prefabricated construction that it's necessarily cheaper. But possibly if we were to move to greater volume, it could be cheaper. And, and all I would say to you is that I have seen with my own eyes in Alva a scheme by Link Housing Association where the external cladding on the scheme um, makes it suitable for the for to, to fit in with the, lo the local environment in a way which these um, the, the buildings as they arrive foil wrapped off the back of a lorry I kid you not um, you would think that they were all going to be exactly the same but actually once they've been clad they well, look I'm, much I'm more suitable. going to bring Mr Gibson back in but Julia Fitzpatrick was okay, indicating sure. first very, very quickly and it was just really about, about that point about standardization I think if I speak for, for my own association, one of the reasons for needing to, to vary is that all housing associations are working off a design standard that was completed in 1998 and it's really in need of improving and updating and that would let us get to a point where actually we could have some variation but actually stronger design standards and that would be a a really good base for something that could also read across, I think, to the private sector very constructively. And briefly, Kenneth Gibson, yeah, for another exactly. follow-up. Thank you, I do appreciate that, because, I mean, Mary, Mary Taylor, uh, you know, in your submission, you say that uh, local authorities should make greater use of their power to use new supply funding to support housing associations working closely with a local authority to acquire and improve private tenement flats which have fallen to poor condition. I mean, I, I would go beyond that. I mean, certainly in the rural areas of my constituency, uh, you know, there are a lot of people who are resistant to kind of schemes, if you like, even if it's only eight or ten or twelve houses being built in a village, they'd much rather the local authority or a housing association took over a derelict cottage or something like that and restored it uh, and brought that into into the public, uh, you know, sector, whether it's local authority, RSL. Is that something that you're looking to do, not just beyond flats, but perhaps in other types of housing? Mary Taylor, please. I, I mean, I, I suspect the point that you're citing was actually in the Glasgow Forum submission, but I don't disagree with the point, and I think all I would say is that there... Actually. It was definitely mine, so, well, you know it better than I do, obviously. Um, 
<laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I, I, there are people across, there are associations across the country doing this kind of work and have been for years, but it has to be with a, a, a local climate of, of responsiveness and there's, so there has to be some reception. The problem with the, the subsidy framework is that it only works for new housing. Um, and so we have members who would really like to be developing housing which already exists, which is actually system-built housing, which would lend itself to being occupied by older people at, in a more supported environment than they currently live in. But the subsidy framework doesn't allow any investment other than by them through their um, normal uh, revenue programmes. And, and it's simply not affordable. David Bickbinder. Just to add uh, to Mary's point, as well as the additional uh, subsidy uh, for, for tenemental imp improvement, the a key to making it work is, that the ha is the housing association working uh, ha hand in hand with the local authority, because without the local authority, local authority's ability to support owners with at least some of the costs that owners will be, will be faced with in, the, in, in, in these situations, or, uh, that, or, and, and indeed to support improvement post-acquisition, uh, it's very hard to take those tenemental schemes forward. But we're, we're nonetheless uh, hopeful that as the, pro the current five-year programme develops, more and more local authorities will see this as a, as a part contributor to the overall new build programme or new supply programme. Thank you very much. Could I bring it in Alexander Stewart? Oh, sorry, Tony Keane. I mean, the acquisition of housing in the second-hand market is already an important <laughs> part of the affordable housing supply programme, and it's, and it's not quite the case that it's not supported by the grant arrangements, but it's not explicitly dealt with in the guidance around it. So uh, the Scottish Government officials are approving grant for the acquisition of individual properties um, out with the Homeowner Support Fund, but it's being done in a relatively ad hoc way. Something like 10% of the, the houses developed in the previous five years were, were actually purchased. They weren't built at all. So I, what we have argued is that there should be a, a more explicit approach to funding uh, individual acquisitions, but that needs to be backed by a strategic framework for those acquisitions uh, in the local authority and in the conversations with the, with the housing association. Edinburgh, for example, has quite a sophisticated programme of disposing of houses where they've got one left in a block and maintenance of it is a problem, and acquiring houses where only two are sold and, and getting majority control makes a difference to their management and the service to their tenants. Most other landlord authorities are developing those kind of frameworks. It now needs that strategic framework to be matched by uh, a clear and explicit position within the affordable housing supply program but I think it's an important part of the program absolutely thank you very much and apologies for not seeing you there uh, Ms. Alexander Stewart please thank you Camilla we've heard some very strong evidence uh, this morning from you all and, and I, I take on board all that you've said uh, but when when we're looking at what we're trying to achieve uh, ensuring that the dynamics and the, the the aging population that we have and trying to ensure that we capture them uh, we're attempting to capture the ones who are at the other end of the scale, who are the younger ones who don't have opportunities and are trying to get the opportunity. Uh, so the, the balance of trying to, to fit in here uh, uh, creates a, a dynamic that can be problematic, uh, that it doesn't, doesn't fit, uh, you know, we're not really fitting it properly. The whole system isn't working for everybody. We need to then be specific as to who we try to represent within that base. Uh, and I, I'd like some of your views on how, how we attempt to do that. Uh, and then... The stock itself, I mean, you know, the, there's, there's going to be an opportunity within these building of these houses to deal with energy conservation and all of that. Uh, but should we be using that funding uh, to try and ensure that the stock is at a reasonable and strong level? Or do you think that that is a potential slight waste of money in going into trying to achieve that where we could do more with the money if we were trying to deal with some of the disparities that we have across the sector? Do you have anyone, Mr Stewart, that you specifically want to ask first? <laughs> we were wants to answer it. I mean, it's quite a Someone broad wants to volunteer. <laughs> Do we have any? Mary Taylor. Um, I, I, th I think you're right to highlight that it's at both ends of the spectrum. Um, because I think I, I, people in the middle are relatively well housed, unless they're homeless. And, and life crises, as I think recent... Um, press coverage has, has highlighted can hit anybody at any time and uh, can result in homelessness and destitution. Um, 
but it's young people who are particularly badly off at the moment. And I don't think that we're doing anything specific about young people, but they should be met if we're meeting the general needs of the population. I think where it's uh, about older people or people with particular needs, whether it's around disability or support needs or whatever, actually does require a more focused uh, endeavour. And it struck me in the earlier part of the conversation that one of the things that this committee could do is actually um, ask for an analysis of the ships uh, that come in. Uh, forgive the pun there. Um, three ships? No, 32 ships actually will come in just before Christmas as it happens. Sorry, I'll, I'll not pursue that joke any further. Um, and it would be appropriate for you to ask for an analysis of what sort of needs that are, are being met by these ships. Um, and in particular, how far they go to meet the needs of older uh, people and people with particular needs, which we'd highlighted as not being responded to previously. Because if they are falling short, then maybe there's a need to go back to ministers with, spe with that specific recommendation and to ask for them, ask them to explain why that wasn't accepted the first time round. David Bickpainter. Um, yes, um, I may have misunderstood part of the question, but I, d I don't think any of us around the table would think that. Um, in, in, in the new social affordable housing programme, the energy efficiency uh, standards, which would come through the building regulations, should be should be should be changed in any way. They are they they, they are rightly um, challenging, but they're a key part of keeping that house affordable uh, in, in the long term and in the in the current in the current climate. That that's absolutely critical. So whatever uh, issues we're trying to address elsewhere in the system, I, I don't think any of us would think it should be at the cost of energy efficiency. Professor Gibb, I wasn't sure if you were trying to catch my eye or not. Not, not, no, not that's this fine. time. No. Uh, however, Tony Kane seems to. If I may, I, I, the issue of the existing stock and how it's treated and maintained is absolutely critical. 80% of the houses standing in 2050 are currently standing, and many of those are not good enough so far as energy efficiency is concerned. So, But to be fair to the Scottish Government, the, uh, the Scottish Energy Efficiency Programme and National Infrastructure Priority is in the process of developing a response. Now, there are some big asks being made by organisations like the existing Homes Alliance about how quickly houses should be brought up to uh, uh, an adequate or an appropriate standard. I think there's a judgment in there about what's achievable within the resources available. But that conversation is a relatively strong one. The issues are very fairly well understood. Uh, and the risks associated uh, with it are fairly well understood. One of the risks being that if you insist that a property can't be occupied unless it meets a particular standard and it costs too much or it's beyond the owner or it's beyond the landlord, what happens to that property? Th that takes you to a secondary question about the rate of demolition. At the current rate of demolition, the standing public sector housing would need to be standing still in 900 years time. We don't demolish very many houses and at some point we'll probably need to think about demolishing more than we do. Uh, but more broadly, issues around older people, back to what I said, most of them live in owner occupation. Not all of them by any means have substantial houses with no mortgage that they can sell. And some big research published by Scottish Futures Trust and the University of Stirling not that long ago uh, indicated very clearly that there's a growing cohort of low value owners um, who may still have substantial mortgages, may have taken out an interest-only mortgage 30 years ago, who now stand very little chance as they age of moving from their first floor four in a block flat to something more appropriate in, in the owner-occupied sector. So there is a st substantial challenge with that particular group of owners that, uh, that we need to be thinking about. Right, Mary Taylor wants to come in. Could I ask you to be brief? We're getting be to briefly, the just, I, I think in addition to the point that Tony has made, it, it's really important to recognise that much of the existing stock is tenemental in nature um, and requires collective solutions. And when you have multiple ownership and tenements, that make, that's, very, that's very difficult to achieve. Julia Fitzpatrick, please. Just, um, I always think it's a slight shame when we think if we start um, thinking about things as being binary in terms of younger, older people, and that, and that there's something around the new homes that we build, and again, back to the question about design and looking at proportions, and our argument would be that we should be looking at 10% of these 50,000 new homes are built to a design standard that would accommodate easy adaptation for full, full wheelchair use but we also need to look at another intermediate standard that it means that there are a broader range of homes that are suitable for a large majority of, of homeowners but in relation to the existing stock um, a key thing obviously is about adaptations and a proportion of that existing stock will not be adaptable but quite a lot of it is we are looking at the moment the Scottish Government has got adaptations demonstration sites the the 
evaluation of those is underway and I think there'll be a lot to learn from how do we make the funding systems and again the investment systems I would argue for a higher base level for 10% of the new build and then allow for more investment in adaptation. Thank you Alexander Stewart if anybody further comment in which case uh, I turn to Andy Whiteman please. Uh, thank you uh, convener. Um, I just want to pick up a point made by Professor Gibb in your evidence um, where you talk about there's a strong case for providing relevant but non-budgetary housing spend information, for example, tax breaks and um, benefits. We're scrutinising the budget, obviously, and it appears from all of your evidence that, broadly speaking, you're um, uh, pleased with the direction of travel, the kind of money that's being talked about, the ambition that's being talked about, and the programmes that are developing. But nevertheless, there are still serious problems around existing homes, homelessness, uh, specific needs of, of sectors like the elderly, uh, disabled, etc. So I'm wondering if Kenneth Gibbon, perhaps others might comment on what are the other non-budgetary sp spends that might be um, looked at. For example, if we could eliminate the uplift in land value that arises as a consequence of planning, approval would release about 30% uh, of housing costs if we could look at issues around planning, for example, in central Edinburgh here, a lot of properties are being bought up by Airbnbs and they're just, they would be far better um, as properties in the social rented sector, but we don't seem to have much control uh, over that. Um, and what we could do to increase the amount of spend on existing homes, particularly tenement properties. Uh, there were one block of 100 tenants in Edinburgh threatened with eviction. Um, Housing Association just recently taken them over. Uh, those those issues are not going to go away either. Thank you. Well, uh, Mr Whiteman has put forward a few thoughts of his own there, but Professor Gibb, perhaps you could yeah. um, contribute. Two, two things, two broad things I'd like to say, I think. One is that uh, to understand the housing system, we need to think about the budget as a whole, the budget and budget in the broader sense, not just the budget the Scottish Parliament has, has a, a direct say over, but the, the things that are spent on housing or are subsidised or taxed, which are which are relevant. So that, that includes things like the land building transactions tax, it includes the, uh, the additional dwelling supplement as part of that as well, it includes the tax breaks to the buy, buy to let sex, sex sector and the way that they change. Those things are all relevant. We've talked a lot about benefits, but clearly the benefit system is, is important. And what I'm really thinking is that you need to you need to kind of present those figures, even where the Parliament doesn't have control of some of them, in order to see what the totality of what's going on is to have a better better sense perhaps of the choices that, that are open over how we decide to allocate our funds. The other part of this though, which maybe goes a little bit off what Andy Whiteman was asking, but I think it's very relevant, is the way that we present our budgets. Because for, and I, I was involved in the previous parliament, the infrastructure com committee, and we, we discussed this at some, some length. How, how, do, how do you present the fact that we spend money in year one, we might have some uh, decisions to build, then some building work, and then some outputs, and we don't really track through the way we go from inputs through to, to out, 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 outcomes, which is, after all, outcomes are meant to be, you know, this, the centre of what Scottish government's work's all, all, all about. But the way that we, we have our budgets, we're talking about spending now for outcomes in the future, we need, we, need to, we need to follow that through in a much more systematic, presentational way in order to see how effective things things actually are. So I, I would certainly support a much broader, system-wide approach to thinking about what's spent on housing, even if it's not spent and the decisions are made by the Scottish Government. seems very important, but also that we present it in a much clearer way than we currently do. Many thanks. Mr Whiteman was interested in any other panel members' views on this. Could you indicate if you would like to contribute? And I would ask you to keep it brief, please. Uh, Nicola Barclay. I think when we're looking at the budget, we have to look wider. And in our um, written response to question eight, so I won't bore you with it because you've got it in front of you. But we really need to focus on the funding of local authority services, especially around planning, building control, rose construction consents. These are all going to be required to deliver these 50,000 homes and more. Um, and at the moment, we're seeing them in decline, people leaving, not being replaced, um, and really have concern that they're going to struggle to cope with all the applications coming across the desks. The other big key thing for me is the how we fund, infra um, sorry, how we fund education. Um, we were delighted to see the infrastructure loan fund that government came out with, the 50 million. Um, loan that was there to unlock sites, but it specifically excluded education provision. And I recognise that 50 million wouldn't get you very much in terms of education, but we need to look at how we fund education because it's probably the biggest blocker to sites coming forward, sites which are 
um, sitting there in plans with planning consents, with developers lined up, but there's no solution to how we deliver the school that's required for those houses. So that's something I would really appreciate um, scrutiny of and, and further conversation on. Thank you very much, Tony Kane. Were you indicated? Just two very quick, quick points then. The absence of taxation of housing in use unquestionably encourages overconsumption. Uh, and you see that in the under occupation figures in the under occupied sector. And I think that distorts the market and is something in the longer term needs looked at. In response to your point about the, the landlord in Edinburgh, the other problem we have is the private rented private sector, private rented sector legislation allows landlords when their businesses fail or when their businesses change or when they decide to disinvest or reinvest elsewhere simply to evict tenants. There's no protection for tenants in those circumstances, and that seems to me to be, uh, and this reflects the evidence we gave at the time, uh, wholly inappropriate. Mr Whiteman. Thank you. Okay, I think the issue... Uh, yes, Kev Gibson. Supplementary about I mean, and Nick Abatla talked about planning there. Do you believe that um, uh, one way of uh, resolving the, the issue of declining numbers of people working in plan departments, etc., would be to have full cost fees for applications? Uh, Nicola Barclay. As part of our submission to the planning review, we have suggested that we need to increase planning fees, and the house building industry would support that in return for a faster, more efficient service. Absolutely. Thank you, and it's an interesting issue raised about the education provision. Could I bring in uh, briefly Graham Simpson, and then we're going to have to draw the session to a close. Um, I actually don't have a question. Excellent. In which case, um, I will go round the witnesses and ask if you would like to add anything further to what you've said, or if you have a burning issue that you would like to share with us that hasn't come out because the right questions haven't been asked, then this is your opportunity to do that. So I'll start with Nicola Barclay. Thank you. The one thing which I thought we would talk about, but we didn't, was help to buy. Um, the new scheme that we have in place, the affordable help to buy, is working very well. Um, we do have concerns in this, um, the changing world that we're living in, what the impact will be on the mortgage markets. Um, it was set up at a time when things were looking much uh, more certain than they are perhaps now, given the geopolitical climate that we're now in, and the um, tailoring down of the help to buy from um, 225 to 200 to 175 as a ceiling price does concern our members that we'll end up with a help to buy that only is going to um, be of use to people in very small parts of Scotland because of the, the ceiling price. So I'd just like to you know, reinforce that point. Thank you very much. Mary Taylor? Um, I think that there are, uh, just by way of conclusion, I think that there are some of the challenges that we're facing um, ha have potentially inflationary cost um, implications and the potential to slow down the pace at which we can actually deliver on the target and that doesn't that doesn't say anything about the appetite to deliver uh, on the target but about some of the the real practical constraints and some of those which might be worth returning to it if, on a future occasion is around the use of public land and the valuation of public land which is still it's not just about privately owned land it's also publicly owned land and the way in which the utilities respond, it's not just the planning departments, it's also the utilities respond uh, on the uh, development of infrastructure for, uh, for opening up new, new land opportunities. Many thanks. David Bickbainter. Uh, there's obviously going to be huge pressure uh, on, 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 to deliver at scale, pressure on, on, on local government, pressure on, on, on the Scottish government. I think it's of some encouragement today that we've spent some of the time thinking about the community-led nature of the provision, the quality and diversity of that provision, and we, we need to make sure those things are on the agenda as, as that pressure to deliver at scale uh, uh, is something we all deal with. Thank you. Fraser Stewart. I'd just like to say I'm really worried about the... We might be underestimating the logistics of this challenge and the scale of it. I don't know if we'll be able to deliver it, and I think that we have to, to look at that very closely. I think that given the range of issues and questions that have been asked today, I think we can see that we've got to ask ourselves the question, do we have a coherent and consistent government policy to deal with all of these aspects? Do we have the right machinery in government to have all of these questions properly addressed? I would I would doubt that we currently do. Um, that, that, that's, you know, I think since the demise of Community Scotland, there's been a, a huge resource missing there and that, that should be revisited. Uh, and I think in the context of all the considerations that community ownership and empowerment needs to be given formal pro prominence and priority uh, because it hasn't been given that it could potentially wither on the vine unless it's given more support and more of a challenge and you've just heard all the community empowerment act stuff earlier on if you want co-production if you want ownership you're going to have to support it 
And the last thing is, I'm seriously scared about modular construction after seeing what happened to the gorbals. We're nowhere near being able to do it properly in Scotland. Nowhere near it. So don't over-egg that one. We should get there. We should put a lot of money into research, and that would be government should be supporting that. But we're, we're miles away from that. Standardisation is hugely difficult and won't work in the inner city until we move on to what the Japanese are like. We're about 30 years behind it. Thank you. Tony Key. I'd simply draw the committee's attention to the particular points we make in our evidence around the homelessness service and vulnerable homeless people, the multiply excluded homeless who currently suffer levels of ill health and early death uh, well beyond that of our most deprived urban communities in Scotland. You're talking about an average life expectancy for the, a woman of 43 and a man of 47 uh, who are long term in the homelessness service. They're being failed by a health service particularly our mental health service, uh, and there are significant aspects of the homelessness service and temporary accommodation that need to be improved. Thank you, Julie Fitzpatrick. Okay. Um, just, I think, connecting Mary's point about the inflationary pressures, uh, particularly in relation to the demographic change and, and older people, uh, in terms of the need for some additional premium in the subsidy to support housing, new housing for older and disabled people. Um, but to link that to the earlier point that uh, Ken Gibb made around looking at the budget much more widely perhaps than just housing, because the cost benefits of that to the health system in relation to enabling independent living for longer in communities and without the level of care, um, it, it will come back that way. Thank you. And finally, Professor Gibb. Yeah, three quick points inspired by Tony Kane. Uh, first of all, uh, I'll carry on talking to him about the, the costs of local authority housing foot finance uh, outside, but uh, more importantly, uh, I think he made a really important point about tax breaks to own, own, owner or, or, or occupiers. I mean, there's a lot of nodding around the, the table about that, but that's the hardest kind of political thing to logjam to break is things like capital gains, things like council tax and such like. Uh, Recent experience suggests how hard it is to make radical reform to the council tax. Final point uh, I think I wanted to make from what Tony said was early on he made a real important point about the need for long term planning, long term you know, uh, proposals to, 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 to run through the kind of housing programmes that we want to uh, uh, deliver. A lot of public policy analysts argue that it's hard to, to make policy programmes which, which run over one whole part, part parliament into a second one. But we can do it, and it is done, and it has been done in housing. The homelessness legislation and its implementation shows that it can, can be done. So I think, I think it's not something we should dismiss, the idea that we should really have longer than five-year plans around these things, because it reflects the long-term nature of, of what, what we're actually interested in. Well, thank you very much. Can I just pick up on one thing that was said and advise the panel that we will be taking more evidence uh, next week on community empowerment, which you, you might want to take an interest in that session next week as well. Can I thank you all very much for attending uh, this morning and now into the afternoon. And uh, I'm going to now move the session into private session as previously agreed. So thank you again for coming along. <laughs>